afternoon. So uh, apologies for being a little bit uh, tardy today. Um, we're running uh, between meetings and I just finished education. So thank you very much. Welcome to the Senate Committee on Government Affairs and thanks to everyone who is joining us online. And would members please remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking and would the secretary please call the roll. Vice Chair Arnshaw. Here. Senator Gokachia. Here. Senator Neal. Here. Senator Hansen. Here. Chair Don Deraloupe. Here. And thank you very much. And um, with our presenters for our bill's indulgence, um, uh, I would ask broadcasting, do we have um, our work session uh, participants on the line? Do you know if any of them are here? Chair, this is broadcast. We've got Senator Canizaro and Senator Spearman connected. Okay. I, I think we're going to go ahead and do our work session first. Uh, all of our members are in and out of committee meetings right now doing bills. And so with the indulgence of the presenters, if you don't mind, we'll go through work session. So um, we'll start with, um, I'd like to remind everybody that we'll not be taking testimony on these bills at work session. However, bill we may ask bill proponents to participate as necessary. And um, Alisa uh, Keller will walk us through the bills. Ms. Keller, when you're ready, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Alisa Keller, Committee Policy Analyst. The work session document for today's meeting is available to the members and the public on Nellis as an exhibit to today's meeting. And the first bill for the committee's consideration is Senate Bill 109, which revises provisions relating to the collection of certain information by governmental agencies, sponsored by Senator Spearman and heard by this committee on March 26. Senate Bill 109 requires a governmental agency it collects demographic information related to a person's race or ethnicity to also request information related to a person's sexual orientation and gender identity. Provides with limited exception that such information is confidential. Authorizes the agency to use such information only for certain purposes. Provides that no person shall be required to provide information related to the person's sexual orientation and gender identity and requires a governmental agency to submit an annual report regarding information received regarding sexual orientation and gender. The committee will recall that at the hearing, Senator Spearman proposed a conceptual amendment, which is included in the work session document to provide that agencies without the necessary funding and resources to begin implementing the collection of sexual orientation and gender identity data would not be required to collect such data until January 1st, 2024, and require agencies that have not implemented the collection of data on or before January 1st, 2022, to submit a progress report by December 31st, 2022, and annually thereafter, setting forth reasons for not implementing the data collection and the actions taken by the agency toward the data collection. Thank you. Thank you very much. And committee, any questions? Uh, seeing none, um, do I have a motion? Chair, I move to amend and do pass with the amendments listed in the work session document. Thank you very much. Senator Orenshaw, um, second? Second. Thank you, Senator Neal. And with that, uh, discussion on the motion? And Secretary, would you please uh, do the roll call vote? Madam Chair, I had a comment. I had a I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, Senator Hansen, that I didn't uh, see you. Please go ahead. That's all right. My apologies. I just want to get on the record why I'm voting no after reviewing this. Uh, it makes no sense. If you have demographic collections and then you make the information voluntary on certain things, it loses any value simply because it's not mandatory. I mean, you know, all the other things are mandatory, but then when it comes to sexual orientation, it's not. Therefore, the demographic data collected will clearly uh, leave substantial things out. So I'm a no. 
Okay, thank you very much, Senator Hansen, for putting that on the record. Um, any additional conversation or questions? Seeing none, uh, Secretary, would you please uh, call the roll? Vice Chair Ornshaw? Yes. Senator Gokachia? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Hansen? No. Chair Don Deraloop? Yes. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, um, the motion passes. And um, I will ask uh, Senator Spearman to uh, take that floor statement uh, for us uh, on the floor. So thank you very much. And we'll go to Senate Bill 150. Thank you, Elisa Keller, Committee Policy Analyst. And the next bill for the committee's consideration is Senate Bill 150, makes changes to provisions relating to housing, sponsored by Senators Harris, Dunyate, Buck, and others, and was heard by the committee on March 8th. Senate Bill 150 requires, with certain exception, a governing body to allow tiny houses in all zoning districts that allow single family residences, and it allows, with certain exception, a governing body to allow tiny houses in a zoning district that does not allow single family residences. The bill also sets forth certain building and inspection requirements for tiny houses and requires a governing body to adopt an ordinance authorizing tiny houses be located in a tiny house park. The committee will recall that at the hearing, a conceptual amendment was proposed by Senator Harris to replace all sections of SB 150 and after the hearing, Senator Harris proposed an additional amendment. The conceptual amendment included in the work session document includes all proposed amendments. The proposed amendment defines tiny house by reference to the International Residential Code Appendix Q or its successor version, requires local governments with a population greater than 100,000 to designate a zone for tiny houses as an accessory dwelling unit, also known as an ADU, and a zone for tiny houses as a single family dwelling unit and to allow them within tiny house parks in accordance with local zoning and land use policies. Requires local governments with a population of 100,000 or fewer to designate a, a zone for tiny houses as an ADU or a zone for tiny houses as a single family dwelling unit or to allow them within one or more tiny house parks in accordance with local zoning and land use policies. Provides that the certificate of occupancy for a tiny house may allow occupancy only for residential use as either a single family dwelling unit or as an ADU. Requires that a tiny house park created pursuant to the bill must require certain provisions, including spacing for public safety access, water service, minimum space requirements, size requirements, parking, and appropriate open space. Provides that a local government may provide other requirements for a tiny house structure and provides that the bill becomes effective on December 31st, 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much. And do we have any uh, discussion? Oh, I'm sorry, any questions from the committee? Yes, Madam Chair. Senator Neal, please go ahead. So although I appreciate the work done by Senator Harris and um, on tiny houses, um, I won't be supporting this. I can't. Okay, thank you very much. Um, additional comments or questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none. Um, do I have a motion? Uh, Chair, I move uh, to amend and do pass with the amendment that's listed in the work session document. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Orenshaw. Do I have a, a second? Can I second if I voted now? I'll second the motion, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Senator Gokachia. Thank you very much. All right, um, with uh, that, um, if I have uh, 
Would the secretary would please take a roll call vote? Vice Chair Ornshaw. Yes. Senator Gokachia. Yes. Senator Neal. No. Senator Hansen. Yes. Chair Don Deraloop. Yes. And with that, uh, the motion passes, and I'll assign that for a statement to Senator Harris, and um, we'll move on to Senate Bill 200. Thank you. Elisa Keller, Committee Policy Analyst. Senate Bill 200 provides for the establishment of a retirement savings program for private sector employees sponsored by Senator Harris and Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson, and was heard by this committee on March 31st. Senate Bill 200 establishes the Nevada Employee Savings Trust, along with the Board of Trustees to establish a retirement savings program for private sector employees. The bill requires the state treasurer to provide staff support to the board within the limits of appropriations and authorizes the state treasurer to provide administrative support. The bill provides that the program created by the board must include requirements that covered employees must automatically, covered employers must automatically enroll all covered employees in the program unless a covered employee opts out of the program. Contributions to a covered employee's individual retirement account must be withheld from the employee's compensation at a rate set by the board unless the employee elects not to contribute or to contribute at a different rate. A covered employee may withdraw up to $1,000 of contributions to meet a financial or other emergency, and the board must prepare certain informational materials regarding the program for distribution by covered employers to covered employees. The bill also provides certain protections from civil liability for covered employers, the state, and board members for certain decisions made by employees or the board in connection with the program. Finally, the bill provides that members of the board, its staff, and program administrators are fiduciaries with respect to program participants and are prohibited from engaging in certain financial transactions in connection with the program. The bill requires an annual independent audit and report be submitted to the governor, state controller, and the legislature. And there were no proposed amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from committee members? Do I have a motion? Uh, I move uh, to pass on SB 200. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Orenshaw. Do I have a second? I'll, I'll second that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hansen. And uh, discussion on the motion? Will the secretary please take a roll call vote? Vice Chair Orenshaw? Yes. Senator Gokachia? I'll vote yes with reservations on the floor. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Hansen? Yes. Chair Don Deraloop? And I'm a yes. And with that, uh, the motion passes, and I'll sign the floor statement to Senator Harris. Uh, with that, we'll go to Senate Bill 222. Thank you, Lisa Keller, Committee Policy Analyst. Senate Bill 222 revises provisions relating to governmental administration, sponsored by Senator Scheibel and was heard by this committee on March 22nd. March 22nd. Senate Bill 222 requires state agencies to, to collaborate with minority groups on policies, agreements, and programs that affect minority groups and ensure that programs and services are accessible and inclusive. The bill also requires state agencies to designate a diversity and inclusion liaison and sets forth certain duties of the liaison. Finally, the bill requires the Office of Minority Health and Equity of the Department of Health and Human Services to facilitate a meeting between the liaisons and minority groups at least once a year and compile an annual report regarding findings and recommendations. At the hearing, a conceptual amendment included in the work session document was proposed by the bill sponsor to 
add definitions of Commission on Minority Affairs and Office for New Americans in Section 5, remove Bureau Board Commission from the definition of state agency in Section 8, add to the extent possible, make other clarifying changes to the description of duties set forth in Section 10, require that the contact information of the liaison be provided to the Office of Minority Health and Equity, the Commission on Minority Affairs, and the Office for New Americans in Section 11, and provide that the required annual meeting between the liaisons and minority groups in the subsequent report be facilitated by collaboration between the Office of Minority Health and Equity, the Commission on Minority Affairs, and the Office for New Americans in Sections 11 and 12. Thank you very much. Um, any uh, discussion, any questions from the committee members? Senator Hansen, I see you waving the flag there. Thanks, Madam Chair. Question on section four of the amendment. Minority group means, uh, and C, it says a group of persons that share the same sexual orientation. Then under uh, definition, it says as used in this section, Sexual orientation means having or being perceived as having an orientation for heterosexuality, homosexuality, or bisexuality. The only problem with that is, how do you get uh, roughly 95% of the people identify as heterosexual? So technically under this amendment in this bill, a group of people like myself could qualify as a minority group identifying as heterosexual. I'm kind of wondering, was that the intent of the amendment? Um, I do not see Senator Scheibel on this. I will ask um, Ms. Keller, can you answer that or Ms. Clarison? Madam Chair, um, this is Heidi Clarison with the legal division. Um, that language, in the definition of minority group relating to heterosexuality was included in the original bill as well. Um, so it's not just a change in the amendment, it's a change or it's a it's language that came from the original bill. So I can't speak to um, Senator Scheibel's intent, but it would appear that based on the language, both of the bill and of the amendment, um, heterosexuality could be a minority group. Okay, well, I, you know, I'm fine with that. I'm against the bill anyway, but uh, to me, that just seems crazy that essentially you could be a member of uh, what everybody identifies as the 95% majority and still be considered a minority. So but in this day and age, everything seems to go. So what the heck? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be a no on this one. Thanks, Senator Hansen. Um, additional questions from the committee? Any other hands? Okay, with that, I'll take a motion. Here, I move that we amend and do pass Senate uh, Bill uh, 222 with the amendment listed in the work session document. Thank you very much, Senator Orenshaw. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Senator Neal. And uh, any, com any uh, questions or comments on the motion? Would the secretary please take a roll call vote? Vice Chair Orenshaw. Yes. Senator Gokachia? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Hansen? No. Chair Don Deraloop? Yes. And the bill passes, uh, four to one, amend and do pass, and I'll assign the floor statement to Senator Scheibel, and I'm sure she'll be glad to explain all that to you. All right, with that, we will go to Senate Bill 294 um, from Senator uh, Canizero and uh, Ms. Keller, please go ahead. Lisa Keller, Committee Policy Analyst. The next bill for the committee's consideration is Senate Bill 294, revises provisions governing collective bargaining by local government employers, sponsored by Senator Canizero and was heard by this committee on March 29th. Senate Bill 294 provides that in negotiating a collective bargaining agreement between a local government employer and an employee organization that represents local government employees, 
other than firefighters, police officers, teachers, or educational support personnel. The findings and award of a fact finder are final and binding on the parties. The bill also provides that in, later, in labor disputes involving firefighters or police officers, unless the parties agree to make the findings of the fact finder final and binding, the report of the fact finder must include recommendations for settlement of the dispute in lieu of an award, and the findings and recommendations of the fact finder are not binding on the parties. Uh, subsequent to posting the work session document, staff received a proposed conceptual amendment from Senator Canazaro, which is now available on NALIS. And it is my understanding that Senator Canazaro is available to discuss the proposed amendment. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from the committee? And Madam Chair, if you like, uh um, I, uh, Nicole Canazaro, Senate District 6, I am happy to talk about the high points of the proposed amendment um, and then also had one clarifying piece. And all, I am also, I believe we have with us in case there are questions from the committee, um, Mr. Horvath, who would be able to help answer those as well. I would appreciate the highlights of the amendment, please, Senator Canazaro. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And again, Nicole Canazaro, Senate District 6. The proposed mock-up would, uh, it seeks to to um, outline a couple of changes. Um, first and foremost, it generally establishes a different structure for collective bargaining by cities, which would allow a city and an employee organization to participate in an initial round of non-binding fact-finding. And if disagreements remain, following that first round of fact-finding allows either party to request a second round of fact-finding, which would be final and binding on the parties. Um, it then also reverses the changes in sections two and three of the introduced version of the bill, that would require those decisions of a fact finder to be binding for all local government collective bargaining, except those related to police and fire, which would leave in existence um, the current law for local governments other than cities, except for the elimination of panels to review and issue binding orders relating to fact finding. Additionally, um, we wanted to be clear um, with the language and we'll ensure that the, that the final amendment also includes um, clear language that the that section one would not apply to collective bargaining between cities and police or fire unions representing those city employees. They have a separate process, but with this mock-up, uh, this process would look more like those um, in place for the police and fire, um, but want to make sure that we're not changing that aspect of NRS for them. Thank you uh, very much for that explanation. Um, questions from the committee? Senator Canizero, um, I have one um, where it says, hang on, hang on. Where it says in section um, two, uh, subsection 10, the issues which may be included in a recommendation or award. Could you explain the difference? Like just kind of clarify what recommendation and award is, please. Sure, and thank you, Madam Chair. I may need to have Mr. Horvath help to explain that particular piece. In Good afternoon. Madam Chair, um, it's just a matter of timing, so they can be recommendations. And uh, often when the fact finder makes recommendations, the parties are able to work out uh, an arrangement, but the award deals directly with a, uh, an agreement by the parties in advance of making the fact finders recommendations binding, or the award is also included in binding arbitration. Thank you very much. That helps me um, clarify that piece. I appreciate that. You bet. Any additional questions from the committee? Seeing none, I'll accept a motion. Vice Chair Earnshaw. Uh, yes, yeah, pardon me, my mute was on chair. I move that we amend and do pass with the amendments proposed by Majority Leader Canizaro in the mock-up that is currently on Nellis. 
Thank you very much. And a second, Senator Neal? Second. Thank you very much. And with that, any discussion on the motion? Yes, yes Senator Harris, Hansen, sorry. Thank you. Uh, the new conceptual amendment makes it sound a lot better, but frankly, I haven't had a chance to really dig into that. So I am going to be voting no. But uh, yeah, the, the issues of it being cumbersome and bypassing some existing processes, it sounds like the amendment may have actually taken care of some of my concerns. But at this point, I'm going to be a no. Okay, sir. Madam Chair. All right. Yes, Senator sir. Chief, I'll support the motion, but uh, my reservation is to change my vote on the floor. Thank you very much, Senator Gokachia. Okay, seeing no more hands, uh, will the secretary please do the roll call vote? Vice Chair Ornshaw? Yes. Senator Gokachia? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Hansen? No. Chair Don Darrell-Loop. Yes. Thank you very much. And with that, the motion passes four to one. And I will ask Senator uh, Canazero if she would like to uh, take her own floor statement from Government Affairs. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. And we will go to our last work session bill, Senate Bill 311, please. Ms. Keller. Lisa Keller, committee policy analyst, Senate Bill 311 revises provisions relating to rural housing, sponsored by Senator Raddy and heard by this committee on March 26. Senate Bill 311 authorizes the Nevada Rural Housing Authority to create a for profit business entity to prepare, carry out, operate, and otherwise manage housing projects provide for the construction, reconstruction, improvement, extension, alteration, or repair of housing projects, enter into a public-private partnership to finance a housing project, construct or operate a housing project for profit, and make certain payments in lieu of taxes relating to the development, operation, and management of housing projects. The bill also authorizes the business entity created by the authority to rent or lease accommodations to persons with a higher income, provided the housing project primarily serves persons of low or moderate income. And there were no amendments proposed for this measure. Thank you very much, Ms. Keller. And it's my understanding Senator Raddy is here to answer questions. So are there any questions from the committee? All right. I don't think I see anybody waving white flags at me, so I will, Senator Hansen. No, you're a no, Question you're, 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 you're I may ask on this one. <laughs> All right, thank you, sir. All right, with that being said, um, since we don't have any discussion, uh, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Chair, I move that uh, we do pass Senate Bill 311. Thank you very much. And I'll take a second. Second. Thank you, Senator Gokachia. And any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, Secretary will please do the roll call vote. Thank you. Vice Chair Ornshaw? Yes. Senator Goko, go, excuse me, Senator Gokachia? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Hansen? Yes. Chair Don Darrelloop? Yes. And with that, um, the motion passes and we will ask Senator Ratty if she doesn't mind. She can take the role, the uh, floor statement on that. And with that, we are done with our work session. So we will uh, jump back to our regular agenda. And I believe we're going to start with Senate Bill. Uh, we're going to go just slightly out of order. And we're going to start with Senate Bill 302. Am I correct, uh, Ms. Keller, on that? That's my understanding, yes. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I, I it's been a 
I've gone from one thing to another today, so I just wanted to make sure. Yes, Senator Gokuchia, please go ahead. Yes, Madam Chair, I, I have a bill up in uh, growth and infrastructure, I guess it is, uh, so I might be ducking out here at some point. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate you letting me know. And uh, we'll move on to Senate Bill 302. And uh, with that, um, we'll ask uh, this measure revises provisions relating to governmental uh, administration. And I think Senator Spearman is with us um, virtually and uh, if she would like to go ahead and then she can hand it over to her presenter. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. For the record, I'm Pat Spearman and I represent Senate District 1 in North Las Vegas. And today I'm here to present for your consideration, Senate Bill 302. I'll go over a couple of the highlights, uh, but then I'd like to give it to Ms. Tina Dorch, who is currently the uh, Director for the Office of Minority Health and Equity. Uh, first of all, I wanna start with uh, something we did last summer, Senate Concurrent Resolution 1. Uh, which every legislator in both houses, it was by Carmel and bipartisan, um, voted to assert that in Nevada, we believe that racism is a public health crisis. Uh, for more than 30 years, uh, we've known about this, but it took the, <clears throat> it took the COVID pandemic to really um, elevate that to uh, the consciousness of most people. We also know that <clears throat> systemic racism, as it has stood for so many years, um, has rendered the healthcare system um, almost non-existent for um, communities of color, for BIPOC communities. And so what this bill is really designed to do is designed to correct the deficiencies that have existed, that um, perpetuated uh, the comorbidities that were identified uh, by CDC and other scientists as making persons with those comorbidities more susceptible to um, receiving and fatalities for COVID-19. Uh, this is a very simple piece of legislation and it empowers the Office of Minority Health and Equity to get some things done because we all know that it's not a matter of if. It is a matter of when the next pandemic will hit. And we also know, <clears throat> we also know that whenever any community is left out of, especially uh, the healthcare system, we know that it costs us more money in the long run than it does in the short run. And I always try to um, use the analogy of, you have to get your oil changed and you need to get it changed at the intervals recommended by the manufacturer, and you can decide you don't want to do it, but if you don't do it, then down the road, you're going to have a significantly more expensive proposition in getting the um, getting your whole engine uh, replaced. So with that, I'd like to talk it, uh, toss it to Ms. Tina Dorch, and she can run through the sections of the bill, and there's some other people um, that uh, she has that will also help us with this presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And Ms. Deutsch, when you're ready, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon and thank you um, um, to the Senator for allowing me this opportunity. My name is Tina Dorch. For the record, that's spelled D as in David, O-R-T-C-H. I have managed the Nevada Office of Minority Health and Equity to be referred to interchangeably as either NOMI or the office going forward. Since 2018, the office began in 2005 and I am its eighth program manager. I'd like to say thank you to Chairperson Marilyn Dondero Loop and Vice Chairperson James Orenshaw and members of the Senate Committee on Government Affairs. And I will use my time to address five topics of Senate 302. The first topic is that of racial equity. My assuming this position marked a pivotal shift in the focus of the office. While its mission, which is to improve the quality of and access to equitable health care for Nevada's minority groups to combat health disparities, remains fundamentally intact, the approach to achieve it has been redirected. 
per the late Assemblyman Tyrone Thompson's Assembly Bill Number 141 from the 79th Legislative Session, the office's charge was aligned with nationally trending health equity initiatives that prioritize activities that resulted in the institutionalization or the systematizing of equitable health determining efforts. Be these efforts outreach and awareness, be they regulatory, be they policy or programmatic in nature. In keeping with the intent of Assembly Bill 141, the current Assembly Senate Bill 302, Section 3, further clarifies the focus of the office to specifically include the promotion of racial equity. The second topic I'd like to talk about from the bill is racial equity training. Senator Spearman's concurrent resolution number one, as well as Governor Sisolak's proclamation naming racism as a public health crisis, elevated the need to expand race-based equity training. Currently, the Department of Health and Human Services is assessing workforce inclusivity as the state's largest and most public-facing agency. Requirements in Senate Bill 302 build on legislation from the 80th legislative session that focused on staff and health-related settings. Specifically, Senate Bill 364, which requires employees and agents of health facilities to receive certain training related to cultural competency, and Senate Bill 470, which requires the State Board of Health to require a medical facility needing to be licensed to itself conduct cultural competency training for certain agents and employees of such a facility. Senate, 30, Senate Bill 302 now widens this focus to include all public officers and employees, including those in professions addressing non-health specific determinants of health. This component of the bill addresses implicit bias, it fosters allyship, and it serves to embed health-related equity. The third topic I'd like to focus on is the racial equity worksheet that is described in this bill. To the extent that funding is available, Section 8 describes requiring legislative counsel to work in consultation with the office's advisory committee and the development of a racial equity worksheet to be used during the bill draft resolution process. In response to its elevated focus on racial equity, this advisory committee will analyze completed equity worksheets to shape policy recommendations, to identify discriminatory structural barriers, and to establish a system of measurement to track improvements. Because a purpose of the racial equity worksheet is to enable a requester to consider racial equity, the worksheet aligns with the development of health impact notes a health and all policy or high up resource that reports the effect of a program or action that will have on a community's well being. Beyond developing the worksheet, assistance with translating equity goals into action could be supported function of the Office of Minority Health and Equity staff. This component of the bill allows for the identification of social determinants connected to health problems and serves to embed health-related equity. The fourth topic is that of proportional allocations. Early in the pandemic, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, framed the projected insufficient project protections and supports for BIPOC persons as a matter of civil rights in a report titled 10 Equity Implications of the Coronavirus Outbreak in the United States. NOMI, in collaboration with the Office of Analytics, will provide technical support to DHHS programs on the provisions of Senate Bill 302 that propose revisions and expenditures related to BIPOC persons be made in direct proportion to, dis to the disproportionate effect of the healthcare issue on each of those BIPOC groups. NOMI worked with the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Analytics to introduce vulnerability indexing to the department's 2021 Minority Health Report. With a year's worth of data collection, this CDC-recognized methodology has been used to now develop its COVID vulnerability index. It gauges the, the degree of burden a target population bears due to COVID-19 filtering by zip codes. 
NOMI will work to incorporate vulnerability indexing in the proposed racial equity worksheet. This component of the bill addresses social justice and serves to embed health-related equity. The fifth and final topic that I would like to point your attention to is the NOMI infrastructure subject. This bill introduces the creation of a minority health and equity account, a dedicated account that will be a fiscal resource to further empower the office's reach. To meet the growing administrative needs outlined in Senate Bill 302, the overall mission and function of the office and specific requirements such as advisory committee support, a fiscal note of $497,106 per biennium will be requested with Senate Bill 302 to establish to sustain staffing infrastructure. That concludes my remarks and thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I will, are there any other presenters with this um, bill, Ms. Dort? Yes, Madam Chair. I believe next we're going to hear from Dr. Carmen Jones. Okay, Dr. Jones, um, I am looking for you when you are ready. There you are, Dr. Carmen Jones. Welcome to Government Affairs. Please go ahead when you're ready. You are muted, muted ma'am. There we go. Good afternoon, chairman and committee members. So thank you for allowing me to speak today in support of Senate Bill 302. As mentioned, my name is Dr. Carmen Jones. I'm a pediatrician by training and have been practicing in the Las Vegas Valley since 2002. Approximately three years ago or so, I converted my practice completely to helping patients use cannabis as medicine and other wellness practices, more specifically on how to prevent problems and maintain health. After nearly, nearly 30 years of practice, I have worked in many areas of medicine. I've worked in the urban west side of Chicago, my hometown, and I have worked in rural Southern Illinois. I have worked in private practice and I have worked in very busy intensive care units. None of these places are exempt from racial bias. And when I use that phrase, I'm referring to the interaction between the healthcare system as a whole to the patient seeking help. So to me, it's simple. It becomes an issue of common respect for your brother or sister uh, of a different life experience. A lot of people believe that racial equity and inclusion training somehow suggests that we are forcing people to be politically correct. I reject this assignment of words because as people, as Americans, we all have different life experiences. And it's usually asked of our neighbor, uh, all that is usually asked of our neighbor or friend or our coworker is that they respect our individuality. Therefore, this has nothing to do with being politically correct. It just has to do with being socially conscious or better said, with being a good neighbor. It's kind of sad to me to see that this has to be written into law, but I understand that as a society, we need to adjust every now and then to the changing demographics and needs of the state and of this country. As a member of the African-American community, I certainly understand the need for racial diversity training in healthcare. Most of us have received negative stereotypical behavior assigned to us, whether it be as a patient or as a provider. Naturally, there are varying differences of experience um, as with any other human uh, person, but the need for racial equality in healthcare is undeniable in this country. This became abundantly clear over the past year as the country found itself in the grips of a pandemic. Perhaps those that don't believe, uh, there are those that don't believe inequities exist. Well, I guess that's fine, uh, except for simply believing it does not make it so. There are plenty people, plenty of people, both providers and patients, to attest to these systemic challenges. Here are a few more obvious ones. Um, we all know that there's sometimes, oftentimes, difficulty in accessing health care or trust of the system in general. And sadly, understanding and compassion from the, the provider to the patient. There are systems in place that do not allow for current equity to be had by all. Those things can be changed. Once we make a decision as a society to take care of the least among us, 
I believe we will be a better society in general. So to this end, I was shocked to learn that the Office of Minority Health is essentially manned by one person. You know, I've since learned that she receives support, as she mentioned earlier, from the UNLV Department of Public Health, particularly the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition, but is still woefully lacking as it pertains to the large percentage of BIPOC communities in Nevada. Nevada cannot continue in this manner and expect to be recognized as a leader among states. It is very important, and I would suggest urgent, that we properly provide funds allocating, allocated to increasing our outreach to communities of color. The risk is far higher if we do not. There are numerous accounts showing the value of pre preventative measures being a solution to the decrease, decreasing the cost of health care. The Office of Minority Health, can, Minority Health can help in those efforts if properly funded and prepare the most vulnerable, excuse me, funded to prepare the most vulnerable committee, communities for better prevention of illness as, to, as opposed to only being reactive when disease is rampant. I thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have um, uh, additional speakers, Ms. Dorch or Ms. Carmen? Yes, we do. Next, we will hear from Dr. Sandra Mack. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sandra F. Mack, and I am um, a member of the community. I'm involved in uh, many organizations that work with um, Health, 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 wellness, and health awareness. Although the term disparity is often interpreted to mean radical or ethnic disparities, many dimensions of disparity exist in Nevada, particularly in health. If a health outcome is seen to a greater or lesser extent between populations, there is disparity. It's important to recognize. It's it's it is important to recognize the impact that social determinants have on health outcomes of specific populations. Several of the organizations I belong to have health, health committees to work on the disparities. Those organizations, one, uh, the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, another is the Lynx Incorporated, and another is the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. All of, these are, all of these organizations have committees that focus on health and wellness and health awareness. One goal of the health committees of these organizations has been focused on disparities. Many of the health issues that impact African-Americans here in Nevada could be addressed and improved with better access to health care services. We believe that the state should be doing more so we would not have to do so much. We would like to eliminate, not just reduce, health disparities. Health equity is defined as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Achieving health equity requires valuing everyone equally with focused and ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities. A health disparity is defined as a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. Health disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on their racial or ethnic group, their religion, their socioeconomic status, their gender, their age, their mental health, cognitive, sensory, or physical disabilities, their sexual orientation or gender identity, and their geographic location or any other characteristics historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. Health disparities are accessed in the, in, uh, this pop in, the, in the population by tracking rates of illness, death, and chronic conditions, behaviors, and other types of outcomes in relation to demographic factors, including diseases or illnesses and on health care services. However, the absence of disease does not equate to good health. Powerful, complex relationships exist between health and biologic, biology, genetic, and individual behavior. 
and between health and health services, socioeconomic status, the physical environment, discrimination, racism, literacy levels, and legislative policies. These factors which influence an individual or population's health are known as detriments of health. For all Americans, other influences on health include the availability and access to nutritious food, decent and safe housing, culturally sensitive health care providers, and health insurance. Compared to whites, African Americans are at a disadvantage for cancer and other health conditions. They are more likely to be diagnosed at an advanced stage. They are more like more or less likely to get they're less likely to get certain treatments. Then there's the act issue of access to care, which is often less for minorities. By the time they're diagnosed, they're usually in a state where uh, it's more difficult to treat. Among the disparities highlighted in the recent research, African Americans have up to three times the risk of dying from stroke as do people of European descent. Existing lung cancer screening guidelines are likely to miss African Americans, according to a study done by a nurse practitioner at the University of Illinois. And black patients with colon cancer are, le colon cancer are less likely than whites to receive chemotherapy, another recent study found. Another study shows that, that uh, doctors tend to think we have a higher level of, of pain. So when we complain about hurting, they don't take us seriously. So what are the experts doing to remedy disparities? Researchers who study the disparities are hopeful that screening and screening advice issued by organizations such as the Nevada Office of Minority Health and Equity will change as more information comes out about disparities, tailoring the advice to the different populations. This can be done more effectively if there were wellness centers in places where we know the needs are. When trying to improve disparities, it's crucial to think beyond healthcare, says a professor of sociology and associate director of the Center for Race, Ethnicity and Equity at Washington University in St. Louis. Where you live, work, and play matters, she says. In enacting any bill that appropriates money for health care that disproportionately affects blacks and indigenous persons and other persons of color, the legislation should ensure that the money is distributed in direct proportion to the disproportionate effect of the health care issues on, on each of these groups. Therefore, I urge you to pass Senate Bill 302 in its entirety. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Storch. Um, is that the end of your presenters? Um, Madam Chair, there's one last person. Um, I bring to the uh, microphone, Kelly Morning. Thank you very much, Ms. Morning. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kelly Morning and I am the Assistant Director of the Nevada Public Health Training Center at the University of Nevada, Reno. Since 2019, the Training Center has worked with the Office of Minority Health and Equity to address health inequities statewide. A health and all policies approach was used to pilot seven projects throughout Nevada. Health and all policies, also known as HIAP, is a collaborative approach aimed to eliminate health determinants and so, excuse me, eliminate social determinants of health and improve health equity by incorporating health considerations into a framework for multi-agency collaboration. This framework provides evidence-based public health information to develop programs and policies that enhance health and equity across different sectors. A healthier and more equitable society requires participation of all sectors, including government, private industry, and research institutions. Based on the pilot project's preliminary result, results, the training center developed several recommendations to support health equity in Nevada. These recommendations are closely aligned with one of today's topics, Senate Bill 302. Through the implementation of health and all policies, engaging non-traditional partners in public health collaboration has proven to be successful in addressing factors that influence social determinants of health. These can include, but are not limited to education, environment, transportation, housing, and safety. Stakeholders have increased their knowledge of the importance of cross-collaboration to create a lasting impact in their community. It can't go unmentioned that the COVID-19 pandemic created new challenges. It exposed the urgent and critical need for this policy and highlighted the need for health equity to be a priority for supporting Nevada's underserved and marginalized populations. 
Findings support the development of a policy to include health impact notes. This would provide an analysis of how proposed legislative or budgetary changes would likely impact health and health disparities with fiscal notes. Examples of other states with successful implementation of legislation include Massachusetts, New Jersey, Washington, and Oregon. Based on the results, health impact notes should be used to provide a focus on health and equity and be included with all policymaking considerations. This would strengthen council, residents, and legislative staff's knowledge of social determinants of health and opportunities to align a high up approach into action. After participating in, the highlight, in one of the pilot projects, one participant said, quote, after this experience, I suggest that health and all policies should become a state standard. I did some research and some states have a health impact assessments proposed on legislation. I think that if we can do this in Nevada, it would be very powerful, end quote. As previously mentioned, this bill allows for the identification of social determinants connected to health problems and serves to embed health-related equity. This is a public health issue that cannot wait. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak today. Thank you very, very much. All right, with that committee, do we have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Senator Hansen, please go ahead. One quick question. In the bill, I don't see where racial equity is defined. Is that actually defined anywhere in it? What, what exactly do we mean when we say equity? Mr. Um, Senator Hansen, um, I believe that one of our presenters provided a definition. Um, I believe that she explained that equity is the existence of health care and wellness throughout a community that is achievable and maintained in an equitable state. Um, I am not certain as of this writing, if the bill itself has racial equity as one of the definitions at the very beginning of its um, um, material, I will uh, check and circle back to you on that. Thank you. That, the reason I bring that up is normally there's some measurable standard that you could try to reach. Okay, if there's an inequity, you mentioned it repeatedly in the thing, but it's like, okay, when do we reach a parity where everybody says, kumbaya, we're now at, at equity levels. I'm kind of wondering about that. The other thing that comes up, what about personal behavior and personal decisions? Smoking, diet, exercise, things like that. Uh, all those affect all people and all racial and ethnic groups that I know of. So I'm kind of wondering, how do you factor that in when you look at how the healthcare uh, system uh, provides for all groups? Because you know there is differences in how we people personally do things that impact their health. So if you have a disproportionate number of people that smoke, for example, in an ethnic group, would that be reflected somehow in, in the uh, health care provided to those groups? Yep, Madam Chair, uh, can I address that, please? Let me address both of them. Senator Spearman, for the record, Senate District 1. Um, first of all, if, um, if a written definition um, is required for Senator Hansen, that's no problem. We can put in a conceptual amendment. Um, I don't know that we put that in there because uh, by this time, most people know when you say um, racial equity, they understand what you're talking about. But we can put that in there because there may be other people like Senator Hansen who do not know. The second thing is, I think you may have a point there, Senator Hansen, because we know that the OxyContin crisis hit the white people, especially rural white people, more than it did others. But when you talk about a health care system and you talk about a program addressing those things, all of those things are implicit in the program. Uh, I think you heard Ms. Dorch talk about some of the things in terms of vulnerable communities. All of those things are considered in the program. Um, and, <clears throat> and just like we didn't pull out um, lifestyles of um, uh, people of European, European descent in the rural areas um, who were having um, more of a problem with OxyContin than anyone else, uh, because we had a healthcare system that was addressing that. That's why the smoking, drinking, all of those things are across the board. Uh, and I don't know at this point that there is, quote, any one uh, ethnicity that that does those things more or less than others. I, I think I think we all know that if the building had not been shut down uh, this session, there would have probably been uh, several um, receptions, and I've never gone to one 
and not seeing some um, some adult beverage there. So um, racial inequity, that's, I mean, racial equity, that's that's easy to solve. The other piece in terms of lifestyles, um, just, just like we, we did not pull out um, rural um, pe people of, Euro of European descent who lived in the rules uh, with respect to um, OxyContin. And it wasn't just OxyContin, it was several different uh, types of drugs. Um, when you, the, the program that you heard um, Ms. Dortch talk about is a programmatic language that is used not just uh, in Nevada, but it's used across the country. And if you ever look at any type of international uh, journals that speak about um, uh, racial equity, they all, they all say basically the same thing. So, uh, I mean, we, we, can, we can allay your concerns, but uh, that's just where we're coming from. Well, Senator, I appreciate that. My, my concern is that, uh, isn't so much that I don't understand some general concept of it. When you're placing something in law, you want to have something where there's a measurable standard to see your performance. And since so often in these areas, we move goalposts re fairly regularly, I think that that's something that we would want to get in the bill. Secondly, as far as breakdown of smoking and stuff like that, actually, there are a whole bunch of statistics out there and studies that show a definite difference in, in, in different groups as far as smoking, non-smoking, and things like that. So anyway, thank you, Chair. Appreciate the opportunity to ask the question. Yeah, no problem. And I think Ms. Dortch uh, clarified that. I'll ask her to come back on and talk about how the programs that she discussed earlier in her presentation uh, actually address what measurements we're going to use. Ms. Dortch. Thank you, Senator Spearman. And um, Senator Hansen, yes, under the third topic, um, I discussed the racial equity worksheet. And that racial equity worksheet has as one of its um, um, fundamental components, um, the development of a system to measure and track improvements. So with most of these efforts, there tends to be a baseline year to create something to measure against. And uh, to your point, that was thought out and has been um, codified within the language of this particular bill. Thank you very much. Uh, additional questions from the committee? Yes, ma'am. Senator ma Neal, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I had a question on, it's in, I believe it's section eight. This is where um, we're talking about the social determinants of health. And there's policing in here um, and criminal justice. So I need to understand the scope of that. Um, I see where the thought pattern may be, but what's the scope when we talk about the social determinant of health around policing and criminal justice? And then I have a second question. I'm sorry, it's taking me a minute to come off of mute. So let me tell you where it is. Okay. I, I, so see, it. I see it. I just, it just takes me. Page eight. Yeah. It take, takes me a minute to, to get there and then come off mute. So I, I, I got it. So um, there was a 20, uh, 20 study um, that, that spoke about the effects of some of the, <clears throat> some of the uh, policing protocols um, in this country. And that study is, and I will make sure that the secretary has a link so the, <clears throat> excuse me, so the committee members do, uh, responsibility of medical journals in addressing racism in healthcare. Uh, and in that, um, in that article, they spoke about how um, incidents such as what happened with um, Mr. Floyd uh, not only Mr. Floyd, but uh, Sandra Bland, uh, Tamir Rice. Um, when we talk about all of the people, the number of people who have been um, shot, not just someplace else, but also here in um, Las Vegas, how that has a um, detrimental effect uh, collectively on a population. So that's that's where I was going with um, with that particular um, section. I don't know, Ms. George, if you have additional comments. So can I clarify? Because what I'm trying to understand is, are, you know, when I asked about the scope, are we talking about anxiety? Are we talking about behavior? What, what are we getting at, right? Because it, 
policing and criminal justice is very blanket. And so dealing with the scope of the effect on human beings is what I'm really trying to get at. So so we're we're talking about the effect, but we also know that um, there have been several studies um, in JAMA that show that some of the practices uh, by some uh, police, and let me say this, um, there are some very, very, very good police officers. Um, and there are also some uh, rogue police officers that give others a very bad name. So I want to say that up front. Uh, but in JAMA, there have been articles that show that uh, the stress, uh, especially on, for black men, and uh, young black men, the stress of just walking around and uh, knowing that any moment you could be shot uh, or you could be taken into, into custody uh, for various and sundry reasons, none of which have to be true. That um, the mental reaction, the emotional reaction to that is very similar to uh, PTSD. So we're talking about the effects um, of some of those policies on um, people in BIPOC communities. I, I don't know if that, that answers your question, but the effects then also lead to, so what are we gonna do about it? And what we're gonna do about it is something that, um, that I've been talking about since March of last year, and that is uh, to make sure that we have <clears throat> relevant and relatable uh, mental and emotional health um, care facilities and professionals available in uh, BIPOC communities. And it can't be, it can't be, you know, one over the world where it's just one person and then you just give, give that person a call and they'll help you. It's gotta be relevant and realistic and relatable to the population. Yes, and Senator Neal, um, just to your point, um, the uh, effect of um, trauma and stress and the effect of the allostolic load does create um, ex and exacerbate chronic disease within BIPOC communities. And I think that connection is one that we want to begin to try and identify um, its occurrence and relevance here in our state. So to know if that is resulting in increased chronic disease within BIPOC communities as well. So having that component under um, section number eight, as you mentioned, um, including criminal justice, that happens to be the source for quite a bit of that type of allostatic load and stress. Okay. So can you can you talk about sub three, this equity outcome and promotional opportunities and contract awards and how this is being housed? I guess what I'm not clear on, right, listen, I know the Office of Minority Health, and I and I understand what it does, and I also understand this this new title. But what what's concerning to me is, and I'm just going to put that out there, we have always struggled with the money to fund this office. Period. And so what I saw in language throughout the bill was, to the extent as money becomes available, or to the extent practicable, that is code for. When we get the money, when we get the staff, we will deal with all of these things. And so what I want to do and what I want to make sure of is that you don't take on scope that may be under, I think is another bill by Senator Spearman and the Minority Commission, right? And, and I guess what I'm trying to understand is, are you guys targeting this language in this bill in sub two, three, and 3B and 3B1 to then find yourself in this correlation. Oh no, it's not, it's not Senator Spearman, it's Scheibel's bill, to connect these agencies for the minority commission, which is supposed to deal with these other issues versus um, the health office, right? Well, uh, Senator, not to take over and uh, overspeak Senator Spearman, but it is my understanding that these bills are to work in concert with one another. And you mentioned the, the, the Minority Commission, and you're right, they have seven, eight, or nine different uh, subject matter areas, things like housing, 
and uh, we will be working in concert with them. We will be working with other agencies through those diversity liaisons through Senator Scheibel's bill and the Office of Minority Health and Equity by having this fiscal note and increasing staff capacity that is general fund in nature, not grant in nature, will be able then to coordinate and be the, the linchpin with those entities. And that is the difference that there will be dedicated staff that is not grant specific or limited by certain deliverables virtue by virtue of a grant. Okay. And so Senator Neal, can I just, uh, and Ms. Dorch is correct. Um, and um, your question harkens me back to last week when we were in another committee um, and there was language similar to this. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you for calling it out uh, because so many times uh, the language goes in a bill and sometimes people think it's pretty language and there's nothing, they don't have to do anything about it. But um, I know that with the challenges, uh, the fiscal challenges of this particular session, that we had to phrase it like that uh, so that people wouldn't think we were bringing uh, an immediate um $5 million or whatever uh, fiscal note to it. So to the to the extent that money is available, uh, to the extent that they have the money, et cetera, um, and I, I don't know where it is right now, but I do know that in the bill, and I think Ms. George covered it, one of the things that happens <clears throat> all too often is um, money comes into a state, and any state, any state, Nevada is not an exception, any state for um, specific things, uh, and we know that uh, there's been um, COVID money that has come into states that uh, to help recover from COVID. What what the language really really does is the language says um, we should look when dispersing that money, it should be dispersed in accordance with the with the percentage uh, of the people in a particular community who have been affected. And just like uh, when we were looking at ways to deal with the um, OxyContin uh, crisis, um, a lot of that a lot of that money was uh, geared towards um, uh, some of the rural communities uh, more so than in urban areas because that's where it seemed that it was concentrated. So, um, what we're asking in this bill is when the money comes in, uh, we know that BIPOC communities have been disproportionately uh, affected. Um, by COVID-19, uh, instead of just saying, well, we're going to give the same 5%, we're going to give the same 7%. No, if 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 the percentage of that population uh, is 30% or, seven, or 47% or whatever it is, we ought to try to get as close to that percentage as possible so that we can uh, clean up the mess that was made because we weren't prepared uh, for this first round and make sure that we are laying the foundation um, so that it strengthens it in the, in the next round. So, you know, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I thank you for, for calling it out because it, because it is my intention that um, as these bills are looked at, as the questions come, and hopefully as they are passed and signed into law, that we will all remember our commitment to Senate Concurrent Resolution 1. I don't know that we've ever had something that stark, um, that, that, that talks in very stark tones about how racism uh, is so prevalent in our society, because most of the time uh, we're real polite about it. We don't talk about it. And we, you know, we kind of shirk and say, well, you know, these things. No, no, no. You know, racism is a public health crisis. And if Nevada is serious, if we are serious about SCR1, and if we are serious about the proclamation that the governor uh, signed about 15 or 20 minutes after we pass that bill, then we will adhere to Senate Bill 302 and the money will be available because as the money comes in, we will make sure that it is dispersed in accordance with those communities that have been hurt the worst. So thank you, Senator Spearman and Madam Chair. Just one more question. Listen, I understand where you're going, why you're going there. I just want to make sure that the scope of the work um, fits under the office who is now under there. I see the in section 8C where you're gonna create the methodology, you're gonna create the measurement, but I also wanna make sure that you're narrowly tailored, that when you start attributing public dollars to remedy a situation that you're narrowly tailored to an outcome 
so that if there were legal challenges, if there were issues, that you can find yourself in a position where you're statistically sound, where you are in a position where it is tied to an outcome, meaning when, and when Senator Hansen brought this up, if you tie yourself to a parity outcome, you actually can alleviate some constitutional challenges because there is an end date to the remedy, right? So that has been the historical challenges within discrimination policy, like civil rights. When you talk about race conscious policy, when you talk about um, policy that is not necessarily race neutral, you have to be able to, yes, when somebody challenges, you have to be able to statistically self tie yourself to an outcome so that you say, this isn't going on forever. This is actually going to end at a certain date because here are the measurements that I'm seeking. And because you're doing it in the reverse, um, I, I it's just making me think about it because, you know, in 2017, I had AB 354, which deals with your the workforce piece in your in this bill. And I tied it to a statistical measurement. So every time, and it, and it works, it works in concert if we're doing well, if we're doing bad. But in order to make that work, I came up with a statistical measurement to tie the outcome, to tie the relationship. And as soon as parity happens, my bill is no longer needed, right? Because parity happens when we meet this mathematical formula. And um, and I took 11 years of data, right, on inequity, and then I put it in the record. And so what I'm saying to you is not, not to dissuade you, not to say this is not good policy, not to say that when the governor signed the prop that, you know, you had to make it real. What I want to do is make sure that it, it falls into where you need it to go and that the public agencies who you're now telling to do an act, um, you don't have pushback. The difference was I had one area, workforce, that I went after where you're going after several. And in this situation, you have to monitor all of those under each of those agency subheads to make sure that the implementation of this policy is exactly what fits in the vision. And I know... Um, Miss Dorch, but I just, you're crossing into other boundaries where the agencies have never had true, true authority. And I get where we're going. I like where we're going. I just want to make sure that you're, you don't run into challenges because I ran into challenges and I just dealt with one area. Senator Neal, I wholeheartedly embraced your comments and I took some pretty copious notes based on what you said. And I want to assure you that this is not an exercise of the Office of Minority Health going this alone. And that that is why we have diversity officers via the other Senate Bill 222 embedded within other agencies who know their widget better than I do. And I made copious notes to the point that uh, the parity outcome indicators. I know from my past work and in, um, in, in, in this type of work, that indicator creation is a science. And because it is an actual science, this bill does ask for a fiscal note to hire staff that we will be very meticulous about hiring that staff, that this person is versed in these methodologies and that we're able to then um, create common shared indicators that can then paint a picture and put us towards a point of parity. And uh, again, hoping to be able to work ourselves out of this need. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Neal. Uh, ad additional questions from the committee? I don't see any additional questions from the committee, so we'll move on to um, support opposition and neutral broadcasting. When you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of SB 302, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in support of SB 302, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Sarah, you have no callers in support at this time. All right. Um, thank you, broadcasting. Let's go to neutral. I mean, uh, opposition, excuse me. To testify in opposition of SB 302, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Let's go to neutral, please. To testify neutral on SB 302, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers neutral at this time. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Spearman, any closing remarks? Uh, just that based upon the outcomes that we've seen already from COVID and other uh, issues, that this is a bill that um, must pass. I'm willing to work with anyone who has some um, uh, con concerns in terms of the language that is or isn't there, um, but this is a bill that must pass. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. With that, um, we'll move to Senate Bill 110. I understand this is a short bill, and so let's keep our fingers crossed as we're hit, hitting the ten or 5 o'clock hour. Um, go ahead, Senator Spearman, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I have a I have written comments, but I'll just paraphrase. What Senate Bill 110 really does is it establishes a um, task force that will look at emerging technologies and innovation uh, in a way that we can prepare as a state uh, to number one, make sure we have people who are uh, academically prepared, skill level prepared, and also whatever is on the way that we can look and see what industries are out there. And if there is a way for us to uh, recruit them to Nevada for economic development, that we will do the same. Uh, I believe uh, Terry Reynolds and uh, is standing by, and Michael Brown are standing by as well, and they will probably have uh, very short statements on it as well. This is a bill that we had last last session and unfortunately didn't get out, and there there have been a few changes, uh, not very minor, and I believe the lieutenant governor may be on as well. So with that, I will, uh, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you very much. Mr. Reynolds, go ahead, please. Thank you very much uh, for letting me address this uh, this opportunity, uh, SB 110. <clears throat> I'm going to kind of paraphrase uh, my testimony because the hour is getting late. Uh, the Office of Business Finance and Planning is located in our state business center at 3300 West Sahara in Las Vegas. The office is headed by Deputy Director Marcel Shearer. Uh, Deputy Director Shearer and his staff have been providing business technical support, uh, financing tools, as well as providing connections to community and national resources for several years now. The office has a close connection with the SBA and area community financial partners. In addition, the office has a strong relationship with GoEd, uh, working with new businesses that are looking to locate in Nevada. Uh, as a department, we have access to information on insurance, labor, real estate, and financial information, which is a critical resource to businesses locating or and or developing in Nevada. In addition, our Office of Business Finance and Planning oversees the state's new market uh, tax credit program, private activity bonds, and works with go in on opportunity zones. Nevada really is at a crossroad in the development of new technologies and financial services like blockchain data and storage transmission and renewable energy. Over the past decade, Nevada has seen Microsoft, Google, Apple, and Switch move into the state as well as Tesla and Panasonic. Tech companies such as Nevada Nanotechnology, uh, RFXL, Alchemy, and Figure Technology have made Nevada their home. Energy companies such as Ormat, Fulcrum Sierra Biofuels, and Panasonic manufacturer of lithium ion batteries have changed the energy landscape in our state. We are at a point where we need to look strategically at providing business resources to be able to enhance the development of these emerging technologies. SB 110 is an important step in the strategy to identify and develop new emerging technologies that we can build 
upon in our state. We have a good start in diversifying our economy, but we need to encourage and develop these new technologies to provide for our future. Uh, thank you for letting me address SB 110. Uh, we do support this and we look forward to uh, working on this. Uh, we have proposed a friendly amendment uh, on this to uh, designate the uh, Attorney General representative as someone from their Bureau of Consumer Affairs. Uh, we work with uh, Mr. Ernest Figueroa and we would like to uh, see him in that position. He's most knowledgeable. His breadth of information on everything from energy to consumer affairs is, uh, is extensive. In addition to that, we think there should be a representative uh, from the economic development offices, both from UNLV and UNR uh, to participate on the committee. Uh, I also uh, have talked to legal aid about having an independent consumer advocate from a nonprofit agency that can have an independent view uh, of issues as they come into uh, the task force. So uh, we have looked at that and uh, I submitted that to Senator Spearman for her consideration. So with that, thank you very much for letting me testify on this. Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds. Um, uh, Mr. Brown, I see you there. Yes, good, good, good afternoon, Michael Brown, uh, the Director of the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Uh, I previously was Director of Business and Industry and worked with Senator Spearman on this last legislation in the last session, uh, both to try to stay ahead of what was developing in the area of workforce and also to understand how regulators can stay ahead of how we're gonna regulate a, a constantly innovating and changing world. And regretfully, time grew short in the last session in the legislation we weren't, we weren't and able to get it enacted. George Well, the Washington Post columnist, says the future has a way of un arriving unannounced. And uh, certainly in the pandemic, the future arrived unannounced and accelerated all the trends that we saw in the last legislative session. They've all accelerated and I think demonstrates even more of a need to put this kind of a task force together. Now, in my new capacity, we can, uh, we can support this uh, and collaborate with the Department of Business and Industry, which would be the lead agency on it. Uh, I have uh, the Knowledge Fund and Karsten Heiss, who runs that, who has a good knowledge of what's going on in, in this in, in this uh, world. And then we have the Workforce Innovation Program that Stacey Boswick runs. So we have uh, some great insights there that we can we can collaborate with business and industry on. And uh, look forward to uh, uh, working with Senator Spearman in this committee. We had an extensive discussion with Lieutenant Governor and other parties. Uh, Director Reynolds and I did a few weeks ago, and and we all also support the amendment as Director Reynolds uh, outlined. So thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. It's good to see you. Um, any additional speakers for this particular bill? Seeing none, uh, we will go to committee questions. Questions, committee. Senator Neal, do I see you thinking? Yeah, no, I have a question. I could go um, ahead, please. <laughs> um, so, so I, I guess my concern is, I have a couple. I understand the whole point of going, you know, and looking at emerging technologies, but I think what threw me off when I started reading it was, um, you're talking about getting creating a task force and all I saw was the blockchain technology and I and and the internet of things. And so I was really trying to understand what the heck is the internet of things uh, because that's not a real term. So what is it? And it, yeah, what is it? I'll just, I'll put it right there in section four. Terry Reynolds, uh, through uh, you, uh, chaired on Daryl Loop to Senator Neal. Uh, let, let me attempt to, to try to answer uh, that. To us, uh, this allows us to look at all emerging technologies. So it's not just blockchain, it's the entire scope of areas, whether it's energy development, uh, whether it's battery technology that can use to, to store uh, solar uh, energy over time to be able to supplement uh, energy for rural communities. Uh, it, it's uh, manufacturing processes that uh, may use uh, autonomous um, and smart technology uh, within their process. Uh, 
uh, those types of things. So uh, to try to pull all that into and list all that out uh, becomes very difficult. So I think it's the full array of, of technologies that we've seen uh, developing. It's drone technology, it's battery technology, which we have both universities working on. It is um, uh, manufacturing technologies, which we're seeing uh, the use of uh, different uh, tech, uh, smart technology <coughs> computers uh, in the development of uh, the, uh, the technical processes that are used. It's blockchain that's used from everything from medical records to uh, titles in real estate to you know different functions that need to accumulate data to be able to keep track of things and be able to pull it up very, rather quickly. So it's the full array of those types of emerging technologies that this bill contemplates. Um, there's been a lot of buzz about blockchain and about other types of technology, but we look at it as the broad spectrum of what is available uh, within our state and where we need to go to be able to strategize, to be able to bring in these emerging technologies uh, within our state. Um, and, uh, Senator Neal? Oh, if I, can, yeah. I think Mr. Brown was getting ready, but let me just, I want to address your question. The Internet of Things is the umbrella term that's used in the technology world to um, to place all the things that Mr. Reynolds just um, uh, espoused because all of those things are connected in some way to the Internet or need the Internet uh, in order to uh, do whatever it is that they do, drones, uh, money, everything. So the Internet of Things is like the broad uh, umbrella that those things that that uh, that either come out of the Internet or that rely on the Internet in order to function. So, Madam Chair, can I ask my second question to Senator Spearman? Absolutely. Please go ahead. So, so, Senator Spearman, in Section 4, you have AI, right? And so... There's a lot of data out there on art, artificial intelligence and its usage. Um, there's a there's articles on AI and racism. There's articles on. I went to a conference uh, before the pandemic. Um, it was the National Hispanic uh, Conference, and they had a presenter from. He was uh, Dutch. And he was talking about how in artificial intelligence, when you're creating the programs, the way that it's coded opens the door because the person who is coding walks in with the bias that then becomes the piece. So for example, AI could be used in policing. AI can be used not just for cars, but for other things such as facial recognition. There are several things and so I know that you have this task force and you the idea is to grow this technology, but um, I don't see the bill speaking to or addressing any of those things. And there's been studies out for probably about seven years on AI um, and, and, and the range in which AI is developed. And I think that is worth your time and interest to read that. And um, and my final comment is I'm super, super concerned about the language in Section 4 that looks just like the language that I saw in the innovation loan, in the innovation zone language. Like I could, four of the terms I saw in there. And that concerns me in a significant way. So... Um Madam Chair, for you to um, Senator Neal, um, we can tighten the language in terms of AI, and I think that's more of a more of a reason to have this task force to be able to look at things like that. When um, when we first discussed this bill in 2019, uh, Mr. Brown and I, I was really thinking about uh, how many of the jobs for uh, some of our low wage earners will be uh, replaced. Uh, by technology, um, more and more people are going to automated systems. So uh, receptionists aren't necessarily in every office. Um, and, and I mean, that's just just one of them. You got Alexa, and that's artificial intelligence. So I'm I'm certain that we can we can look through the lens of the 
concerns that you have and make sure that the language in the bill is tightened up. I'll say with respect to the um, innovation zone, uh, when we put this language in, uh, I had no idea about the innovation zone. What we did with, I think it was Senate Bill 488 last time, or 488, 472. Um, we brought the bill back with the same language, with the exception of the changes that were made by uh, Mr. Reynolds, Mr. Brown, and the Lieutenant Governor. Um, we can also look at that language to make sure that it is um, uh, separate and apart from uh, so that no one thinks we collaborated with because we didn't um, um, with that. So so your your concerns are noted and we can make sure that we have um, amendments as necessary to address them. Thank you very much. Um, additional comments on that question from anybody? Um, Senator Vice Chair Orenshaw, do you have a, did you have a question? Are you okay? No, Chair, I'm okay, thank you. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure I scan the screen and get everybody. Um, could um, Mr. Reynolds or um, Senator Spearman, somebody address the, um, the task force for me? And maybe Mr. Brown, maybe that's your department, I don't know. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Senator Spearman and I'll toss it to um, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Brown. Uh, so the task force, um, as it was originally envisioned, uh, was a bit smaller, but we wanted to take into um, take into consideration all of the things that are um, happening right now with respect to innovation. Um, we've talked a lot about, in, in this state, we've talked a lot about energy, but energy so far has only meant um, solar, uh, geothermal, and wind. Uh, but there's an emerging technology um, of uh, hydrogen fuel fuel cells. Um, and so as things began to um, come more and more into view, then the task force was um, expanded. Um, they, the, the logic behind that, I'll leave that to um, Mr. Reynolds um, uh, to explain. I know he and the Lieutenant Governor and Mr. Brown worked on uh, um, who should probably be on there and uh, perhaps even the selection point. So I will toss it to him. Thank you, Senator Spearman. This is Terry Reynolds for the record. And I'll uh, also, uh, Mr. Brown, if you'd like to uh, chime in on this. The task force as originally construed was uh, to have the director myself uh, on there as the uh, chair, the commissioner of financial institutions or his or her designee, the director of the Department of Employment Training uh, rehabilitation, uh, one member from a representative of the Office of Attorney General, and that's the friendly amendment that we requested that that be from the Consumer uh, Protection Division of the uh, of the AG's office, uh, but that appointment is up to the Attorney General. Uh, one member who is representative of the Office of Economic Development, uh, appointed by the Executive Director, that's Mr. Uh, Brown's appointment uh, on there. Uh, at least one member who has knowledge, skill, and experience in emerging technologies appointed by the director. Director may appoint as uh, many additional members to the task force as who may have knowledge uh, and <clears throat> experience in emerging technologies as the director deems necessary. Uh, and what we've looked at, I think, is important in discussing that uh, with Mr. Brown and the Lieutenant Governor uh, Marshall, that we have a representative from the uh, Develop, economic development, industrial development, uh, wings of both uh, University of Nevada and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, to be able to, uh, because they have innovation uh, segments within on each campus, uh, and they have people that are knowledgeable in several areas uh, that would be helpful for the committee. So uh, that's the discussion that we had 
Uh, Mr. Brown, if you want to chime in on that. Uh, I will. When I was sitting in Terry's chair, the, the innovation world was largely out, out of sight. It wasn't something that I saw at Business and Industry, which is largely a regulatory agency. Uh, once I came over to go out, then suddenly I saw this, this whole world and found these two professionals on my staff and discovered these two uh, two centers, industry uh, centers at the two universities. And so as we updated this bill um, at Senator Spearman's request, it was like, well, we need to break down these silos and uh, and try to have all these parties at the table. You know, when you when you want to know something about gaming or mining in the state, it's very or banking, it's very easy. There's uh, traditional industry trade associations that have operated very similarly for decades upon decades, uh, and the resources are right there. When you're in this technology. Uh, pardon, uh, Internet of Things world, you know, uh, you don't have those those traditional standbys to turn to. And since these are industries that are built on disrupting existing technologies, ex disrupting existing economic systems, uh, having a task force comprised of these kinds of experts, I think will not only by my office, but very, uh, Director Reynolds' office, um, their business and industry, a much bigger view of the world as to what's going on, and we can try to, 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 stay, uh, to stay ahead of the game, plus provide uh, options for policymakers uh, when the legislature meets. And I'm sorry, Michael Brown, Director of, business and, uh, Director of uh, Governor's Office of Economic Development. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that answer. Thank you very much. All right. Um, any... Additional questions from anybody? Okay, seeing none, I think we will go to support, opposition, and neutral. So broadcasting when you're ready, please. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of SB 110, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 020, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Chair Dundero Loop and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Beth Sewald, last name S E W A L D. I am the president and CEO of the biggest chamber. The Vegas Chamber is in support of Senate Bill 110. I'd like to thank the bill sponsor for bringing this bill forward today. Um, as you all have heard, this bill will specifically focus on emerging, emerging technology industries within the private sector, such as blockchain technology, which has been mentioned, autonomous technology, uh, the internet, robotics, and artificial intelligence. We at the Vegas Chamber support these types of businesses because we recognize the economic value they will have to our community, especially as they pertain to economic diversification and job creation. These emerging businesses have the potential of providing good, solid careers for Southern Nevadans, and they'll also help with our efforts to diversify our economy, which the Vegas Chamber is very involved with in making it more resilient in the next economic downturn. A state task force like this one will complement the work that is already being done by those of us in the private sector. For example, the Vegas Chamber has undertaken a, a brand new workforce development initiative to help address these concerns called the Southern Nevada Workforce Solutions, which is uh, going to focus on accessing resources, creating an assessment map, especially, and then bringing those together in one platform to assist displaced employees with career paths and connect them with the resources that they need. So as I see it, this proposed task force could absolutely help identify the workforce needs of these emerging technologies and then also connect Nevadans to those job opportunities. Um, we believe that this bill will benefit both the state and Nevada's businesses. So with that, on behalf of the Vegas Chamber, we urge your support for this bill. My name is Mary Beth Seewald for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 927, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, committee chairwoman Dondero Loop and committee members. My name is Hava Ahmed, H-A-W-A-H-A-H-M-A-D, and I'm here representing the Clark County Education Association. So um, it's, we are in support of SB 110, 
Um, and we are in negotiations with the sponsor of the bill on adding a representative from NSHE and from K-12 on this commission, along with diversity language. Um, coming at this from someone who has a JD, who is a certified information privacy professional, and who is also halfway through an MBA in growth and innovation, um, having those individuals from NSHE and K-12 will help to streamline the development from emerging technologies into curriculum. And in addition, that diversity language will help us to better um, address issues like the um, inherent racism within artificial intelligence, the um, misnomers of the Internet of Things, and the other um, issues that go along with that. Um, I did want to just clarify for the record that the Internet of Things is, um, is a all-encompassing term of art used in technology, and it includes everything from kind of how your credit system is formed with like what type of data it takes in from the internet to how um, your different apps interact. So it has to do with that data collection, but it really is just absolutely everything um, that goes to the cloud and everything connected from there on. Um, I, so we do have testimony in on the record. It's, I am not sure where we are on that mock-up or um, what exactly is happening with that, but we are in full support of Senate Bill 110, and we are looking forward to making sure that this uh, task force does, um, you know, get started because, you know, at the end of the day, we know that not all emerging technologies are market disruptors, but we know that they all are the future. And so we're uh, very excited about this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 816. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Don Darrow and committee members. My name is Deborah Gallo, G A L L O, and I'm the Director of Regulatory Projects for Southwest Gas, here today to express our support for Senate Bill 110, which would create an emerging technologies task force tracking businesses involved in development of these new and exciting technologies will enable Nevada to support and enable innovation, um, specifically such as the development, production, and use of hydrogen, as the bill sponsor earlier mentioned. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. We are currently in support of SB 110. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 150, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 150, please press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you, please begin. Hi, Hi this is Steve Polakalis. S-T-E-V-E-P-O-L-I-K-A-L-A-S. Uh, Chairwoman Dunder Loop, I'm here to testify in support of SB 110. I am an attorney at law with the law firm of Stephen T. Polacalis Limited, and I represent here today the Western States Hydrogen Alliance. Uh, the Hydrogen Alliance, which uh, is a trade organization comprised of original equipment manufacturers, technology providers, public entities that are focused on accelerated deployment of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies in the commercial and industrial sectors, including fuel cell, electric vehicles, and hard to electrify applications such as trucking, busing, locomotive, aviation, maritime, and off-road equipment uses. Our members include Hyundai, Bowed Powered System, Plug Power, the Rev Group, Capacity Trucks, Protium Company, Taylor Wharton, Eldorado National, uh, just as a very brief primer, as we all may or may not recall from chemistry class at some point in our lives, uh, hydrogen is an element. It is the uh, simplest element on the elemental table. It only has one proton, and it's the most abundant element in the universe. Uh, hydrogen is a clean fuel that, when consumed in fuel cells, produces only water as a byproduct. Hydrogen can be produced for a variety of domestic resources, such as natural gas, nuclear power, even biomass, and renewable power resources such as solar and wind, uh, which I believe that the hydrogen economy can play a large role in Nevada's transportation solutions as well in economic development and growth, and to help the senator uh, achieve some of the goals of her bill, SB 110. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller, please. 
Caller with the last three digits of 462. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hey, good evening, Chair Dondero Loop and committee members. For the record, my name is Joshua Levitt. Uh, that's spelled J-O-S-H-U-A. Levitt is L-E-A-V-I-T-T. -T. And I'm speaking on behalf of the Society for Information Management Las Vegas Chapter, which is a organization comprised of CIOs, industry leaders, educators, and entrepreneurs throughout Southern Nevada. Uh, I want to first off start by, by applauding uh, Senator Spearman for sponsoring uh, Senate Bill 110 and thank the Senator for taking the time to meet with me about the bill. And I also want to appreciate the insights and contributions of Director Reynolds and Executive Director uh, Brown as well. Um, Tim Las Vegas believes that Emerging Technology Task Force within the Department of Business and Industry is a practical approach to attracting technology business to Nevada's and cultivating their growth uh, to further stimulate our economy for years to come. I will admit that I was originally going to testify in neutral and recommend an amendment uh, to include a member of higher education to the task force. But upon hearing uh, Director Reynolds uh, uh, say that uh, a representative from UNLV and UNR will be including in the task force, I will uh, now say that Sam Las Vegas fully is in support of uh, SB 110. Uh, the reason why we recommend representatives from uh, higher education is that emerging technologies of blockchain can be complicated and and may at times require a high degree of education and research to comprehend fully and, and have an explicit member uh, in that role would, would ensure that the task force has, you know, that higher education perspective and understanding. Uh, I thank everybody for the opportunity to speak and uh, ask for your support of SB 110. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. If you recently just joined us, we are in support of SB 110 to testify in support Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers in support at this time. Thank, thank you very much. We'll go to opposition. To testify in opposition of SB 110, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in opposition of SB 110, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much, and we'll go to neutral. To testify neutral on SB 110, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify neutral on SB 110, please press star nine. Chair, you have no callers neutral at this time. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, Senator Spearman, do you have any closing comments? Just real, real quickly, Madam Chair, we know that there have been a number of people in the hospitality industry that have lost their jobs. Many of those jobs are not going to come back because of automation, uh, disruptive technology is taking over. And one of the reasons that this is so important and to include higher education and um, uh, uh, teachers, et cetera, is because we have to make sure that we have a vehicle to prepare those who were laid off and jobs aren't coming back, make sure that they have a vehicle to be retrained for their what next. So thank you for hearing the bill and thank you for your positive consideration. Thank you very much. And with that, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 110 and thank those who presented. And I will open the hearing on Senate Bill 283. I see Senator Brooks. The measure revises provisions relating to local improvements. And Senator Brooks, please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Dondero Loop. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and members of the Committee on Government Affairs. My name is Senator Chris Brooks from Senate District 3 in Clark County. Today I'm here to present Senate Bill 283. Uh, the, the intent of Senate Bill 283 is to revitalize our economy, create jobs, and help us meet our urgent energy and water conservation needs. In 2017, the legislature approved Assembly Bill 5 and an act that provided for the creation of local improvement districts for energy efficiency or renewable energy improvements. That was Nevada's version of commercial PACE or property assessed. At present, in the four years since passage, only two projects have been financed using AB 5's By contrast, across the country, over $1.4 billion 
worth of commercial PACE projects were funded since AB5 passed. Nebraska financed over 31 million, Utah financed over 64 million in that same period of time. We have willing property owners throughout the state. And as a result of our current CPACE statutes, what we don't have are willing capital providers, financiers willing to do business in, in Nevada in the CPACE space. We need to change that. And SB 283 will make that change. SB 283 is a bill that is consistent with the best practices and best legislation that is used to activate commercial PACE in 26 other states across the country. SB 283 removes the unintentional impediments to finance. SB 283 simplifies the structure of commercial PACE to allow direct financing between capital providers and property owners secured by the imposition by local government of an assessment and lien on the property assigned to the capital provider. 283 expands the range of eligibility consistent with nationwide trends, including water conservation measures and resiliency improvements like seismic reinforcements and fire hardening. And SB 283 gets rid of the complicated maximum benefit formula we originally imposed to limit how much could be financed. Committee members, this is not residential PACE. This is commercial PACE where millions of dollars are at stake, lawyers are involved, it's an arm's length deal, and most importantly, any bank that has a stake in the property has consent to make the deal happen. I repeat, this legislation maintains the funding consent, that mo lender consent, that most important safeguard to ensure that the use of PACE makes financial and business sense to a business and to the property owner. Expanding the PACE program is part of Governor Sislak's climate initiative plan. The, that was a, a recommendation that was made in that plan. The end result, committee members, is that legislation that puts us on the right track to attract the millions of dollars of investment that are waiting to come to Nevada and use CPACE. And all the while doing so in a manner that conserves our natural resources. That is why I introduced the bill. And if it is uh, uh, the pl pleases the committee, I would like to hand this off to Cliff Kellogg, who is the executive director of CPACE Alliance, to explain the importance to us. Please, Mr. Kellogg, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the Government Affairs Committee. For the record, my name is Cliff Kellogg, and I am the executive director of the CPACE Alliance, uh, a trade association of capital providers that have invested in the vast majority of CPACE projects around the country. We want to thank Senator Chris Brooks for bringing forth Senate Bill 283 to revise the Nevada statute that authorizes commercial property assessed clean energy or CPACE. I'd like to say a few words about why CPACE can be an important economic development tool for Nevada. CPACE is an alternative source of financing for commercial properties. That is all properties excluding single family dwellings. Property owners can use CPACE to pay for the costs of projects for energy efficiency, water conservation, renewable energy generation and resiliency. No public dollars or taxpayer funds are used in CPACE financing. More than 25 states and the District of Columbia have authorized CPACE and to date, that's a total of more than $2 billion invested in over 2,500 projects. This bill protects the right of existing lenders. The provisions in this bill are the same ones in place in, in, place in dozens of other states. For example, this bill requires the prior approval from any existing mortgage holder on the property as a precondition to the financing. In effect, existing lenders have a veto over whether a CPACE financing can go ahead. The advantages of CPACE include 100% financing for direct and indirect costs, fixed interest rates, a long repayment period that matches the useful life of the improvements. The financing is secured by a property lien and not a personal guarantee, and it cannot be accelerated in default. CPACE can be used for retrofits, new construction, or to refinance projects. Property owners make their repayments together with their property tax bill. If the property owner sells the property, the obligation can transfer to the new owner. Property owners can use CPACE to pay for items like 
heating, ventilation, air conditioning, efficient windows and doors, temperature control systems, roofing, elevators, solar panels. On new construction projects, CPAS financing usually represents 20 to 25% of the total project costs. Projects that could be financed include modernizing an outdated office building, redeveloping an abandoned factory, installing solar, or constructing new buildings. No public funds or public credit are involved. All the funds come from private capital providers and banks. Traditional commercial lenders often leave a gap in the needed total financing necessary to undertake a project, and CPACE is often the lowest cost source to fill that gap. Especially in the midst of the current recession, CPAs can be used to refinance projects. Property owners uh, can uh, that refinance often improve their cash flow and strengthen the property's business operations, all with no budget cost to the government. Again, thank you to Senator Brooks and to the chair and committee members for the opportunity for me to speak on this exciting opportunity for Nevada. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Brooks, any additional comments yes. or speakers? Yes. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Dondera Loop. Um, and I also um, want to mention that uh, Friday of last week, I, I sent over to the committee a proposed conceptual amendment to this bill, um, as, as has occurred with you know so many bills on a very complicated uh, subject in a very short period of time. What what we received back, um, but we, we, we had to make some, some um, uh, amendments to uh, to meet the intent of, of what we were trying to achieve. And so there's a conceptual amendment proposed by by me dated uh, 4-2, uh, and it's on the website for this committee meeting, as well as, uh, as attached as an exhibit to this bill. And so I would, I would ask that the committee refer to that um, as we're uh, walking through this. And um, so uh, next I do have, um, um, Mike Yaki, who who was is uh, uh, working on this project with us, and also who is a expert on the commercial pace space, and and Michael Yaki has a, uh, a presentation that he would like to go through, and 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 Mr. Yaki, if we can keep uh, whenever slides are concerned, if we can keep it concise, I would appreciate that. I understand. Welcome, Mr. Yaki. Please go ahead when you're ready. Sure, then, Dara Loop. Uh, for the record, I'm Michael Yaki. I'm the Senior Vice President and Senior Counsel for Petros Pace Finance. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to share my screen and do a little quick PowerPoint uh, in keeping with Senator Brooks's uh, mandate. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Again, Michael Yaki. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Petrus Pace Finance is one of the nation's largest capital providers of C Pace financing, but I'm also joined in this effort by four other companies, Dividend Finance, Twain Financial, Pace Equity, Greenworks Lending. Together, we represent probably the largest share of the C Pace financing community in the country, and we want to invest in Nevada. As Senator Brooks said, only two projects have been financed since 2017, and we want to bring through these amendments to, in SB 283, we want to bring Nevada to the top tier of CPA states. And just a quick primer, it's a form of financing, goes all the way back to Ben Franklin's first uh, fire, dis fire assessment district back in Philadelphia, uh, where financing for certain eligible improvements in the current law, energy efficiency and renewable energy, are repaid and secured by an assessment and lien placed on the property. Um, you call it district improvements, it's also known as PACE for property assessed clean energy. It's active in 26 states, 25 projects, totaling over 2.4 billion in financing. That has created over 25,000 jobs. And again, we're talking about amending uh, AB5. And the question and why I'm here today is, why are so few projects financed despite really attractive markets across this entire state? Not just in Las Vegas, Clark County, Rio and Tahoe, but many others as well, where we know people have, property owners have contacted us wanting us to invest in their communities. And here's the issue. Nevada needs a conformant CPA statute to national standards and best practices required by rating agencies and securitization standards. What does that mean? It means a statutory framework that, that Cliff Kellogg referred to that is consistent, that enables capital providers like ourselves and like banks 
the access of capital markets for low-cost money and to sell our assets, which creates low-interest funds that we can make available to property owners. And so what 283 does is it takes the existing statute and more explicitly and clearly defines the assessment process from creation to enforcement that conforms to these standards, conforms to the 26 other states of CPACE programs by doing the following, amending the, amending the law to allow a voluntary contract uh, between the property owner and the local government to create, to allow for direct financing from people like ourselves, no bond financing required. It defines documented recording requirements, defines a lien priority in conformance with national standards. It allows, it creates a process for new municipalities to enact a program, and it defines the billing, collection, and enforcement duties of a CPACE assessment. Not only that, but we also have to make it better for property owners to make it so they, so, so they can make their investments. And again, creating it so that Nevada is more in tune with national standards and best practices. For example, Nevada only allows energy efficiency, renewable energy, which is great, but it should also include water efficiency. Much of your state is in a drought and resiliency improvements such as seismic fire. And now because of the pandemic, we are seeing indoor air quality becoming more and more prevalent. Many states are trying to amend their CPA statutes now, right now to include resiliency in addition to the ones that already have it. It retains the energy audit requirement to ensure that only energy efficiency things are being done, but it also removes some of the bureaucratic hassle uh, that makes it difficult for property owners and capital providers to go through the process. The maximum benefit test that Senator Brooks referred to, contractor disclosure requirements, all those are great for residential pace, but not in a commercial transaction. And again, the key to this is maintaining the lender consent requirement as the ultimate safeguard for the property. And then finally, you need a statutory framework that leaves less guesswork to municipalities in establishing a program, providing them liability protection, allowing them to recover costs, and, a clear, and providing a clearer path for property owners to apply. So you'll see in the amendment that we outline those processes for creating the district, for liability protection, for financial protection for municipalities, and creating a program guide and the elements in there, standardized documents, form documents, et cetera, that will make it much easier for property owners, capital providers, and municipalities to create and navigate through these programs. So why SB 283? Again, you want to conform the Nevada CPA statute to, add national sta to national standards and best practices in for financing, for improvements, and for municipalities. It'll create jobs through the investment, environmental benefits, disaster resilience. And I would just note, CPACE is not a blue, red, or purple issue. It is across all America. Just two weeks ago, the state of Tennessee, which is pretty darn red, uh, passed a CPACE statute similar to the one before you uh, by a, unanimously in both the House in the in the Assembly and in the state senate. Uh, Washington state just passed theirs last year by a vote of I think 94 to five. And these are, these are, this is something that is, that it goes beyond partisanship and is into about how we rebuild our communities and how we, how we safeguard our environment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Brooks, for your leadership on this. Thank you, Chair Dondero, for your giving me this time. And I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Yaki. And um, Senator Brooks, go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Chair Dondero Loop. And thank you, Mr. Yaki, for the concise uh, presentation with the PowerPoint. Sometimes they can get a little drawn out. Uh, and it's a, a, of a late hour. And so um, I, um, I I just wanted to um, open it up for questions and 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 hope that uh, Mr. Yaki and Mr. Kellogg um, can, can answer more than I can. But um, uh, as somebody who was involved in this effort in 2017 with AB5 and worked with it in the uh, Government Affairs Committee of the Assembly in, in 2017, um, I, I would really like to see some improvements made that will, will benefit the state and make this more useful to municipalities and developers. Thank you very, very much. Um, committee. Um, with that, um, Senator Gokuchia, please go ahead. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Senator Brooks, or to any of your uh, the people that are helping you. I just need to kind of walk through it. I okay, the way I understand it, and I I didn't look at it in 17 in the in the assembly, I guess. But uh, okay, now you have to have a governing body in in place and and create this uh, improvement district in order to then for the lender would come back through the governmental body, correct? And uh, then it becomes pretty much the same as a tax lien. Is that kind of it in a nutshell? I guess I'm struggling with why the- Mr. Yaki, please go ahead. And and, and Senator Gokuchia, please, uh, 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 we'll probably be, re we'll be definitely be re referencing, excuse me, the proposed amendment. Um, that is that is attached to the exhibit on on this um, this bill in the website in in the answers because I think a lot of that is addressed in, in that amendment. But Mr. Yaki, please. Um, through the through the chair uh, to Senator uh, Gokachia. Pace is based on essentially the public finance infrastructure model. That is an assessment. Normal, for example, you if you do a park, you assess everyone in that area. It stays on their property, what have you. That is that is how that is how essentially the capital markets view pace and why. Just like municipal bonds get get good ratings and low interest and lower interest rates, why we're able to access the capital markets and provide lower interest rates for longer terms. So the so what happens is that the local government decides we're going to offer PACE, we're going to authorize PACE in our area. A property owner says, well, I'd love to use it. They can find a capital provider like like, like Petros, like anyone else, or, or a nearby bank. And then in order to make that assessment occur, rather than going through the public voting process, what have you, it is done by a voluntary written agreement between the essentially the finance authority, the municipality, and the property owner is placed on that property to secure the repayment of the financing that a company like, like Petros will provide. So that's the basic structure of how this will work. The government touches are important, they're necessary, but what we try and do in this, in this legislation is make it as light as possible in terms of the amount of work that any municipality will have to do but at the same time, what we do do, unlike the existing law and why I think a lot of municipalities haven't really joined, is we specifically authorize them to recover the costs of operating the program from the property owner and the capital provider. Thank you. That helps. Thank you, sir. Um, Senator Neal, I believe you had a question. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my question was on, well, I'll just work backwards. Section 16, sub three, um, the, what I'm trying to understand is the location of where these improvement districts will be, because that's what they are, because you're in 271. So, because in section 16, this is where you have, um, it must be, you know, 90% of the value of the property or you can't you can't go over it and then in sex sex and 16 sub 3 you have the boundaries written out which is interesting to me because it says that you may designate the whole or portion or an individual tract of the muni municipality's jurisdictional boundaries as a district boundaries for the purposes of properties eligible for the qualified improvement district so so location matters right and the value of the property matters in order to make this pencil so so where are we talking about this actually happening because that's pretty broad language uh, through the chair please mr yaki i'm sorry i was taking notes please go ahead thank you i i i've been in government far too long not to not to make sure i follow protocol um through the chair um uh, to Senator Neal. I guess the best way to explain this is that the district is sort of the geographical boundaries of the entire area, but only individual properties can actually are, are enrolled within that district. So for example, 
you could the Las Vegas City Council could say the district shall be the entirety of the city of Las Vegas, but then within that, eligible property owners within that district can then apply to the city for them to do the housing. And yes, there is a there is a there is a valuation to this, but we have seen pace in all sorts of 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 places across this country. We are working with PACE right now in opportunity zones in many parts of Detroit, for example, uh, right now. We not and it is anything any place where there is commercial property, whether whether it's hospitality, healthcare, office building, retail shopping, um, any of the, any of those pieces of property can be eligible for CPACE financing. It's it, and it's all within that particular geographic area that the essentially that governing body has authority to to place assessments on. They can't do it. Las Vegas can't do it in in Reno. Reno can't do it in Las Vegas. But if you're a property owner in Las Vegas and you apply to Las Vegas, you can get an assessment and qualify for financing there. Madam Chair, can I have a quick follow up? Absolutely, please. So in section uh, 17, uh, you guys struck out provisions, but this is the provision where it has the qualified um, the qualified improvement project. And basically it says um, the laws of the state um, regarding public works or public procurement are not applicable to the contracts for construction of the qualified improvement contract. So you have a lot of structures in the bill that allow for an assessment and therefore lien, right? So you have the seismic resiliency, a water efficiency improvement project. And so what I'm wondering is why, why, are, why is the, um, why did you have the strike out of the red? And why the limitation on the public procurement process? To the chair. Please go, you, you may go straight, please. Okay, thank you. Um, Senator Neal, the, the, language, the language about the, essentially the public works project laws not applying to PACE financing uh, are in, actually in the, in the current law. And the reason for that is that you're not actually using public funds, you're using private funds on private property to confer essentially a, a private benefit on, on, on private land. Uh, the other provisions that were struck out in red were provisions that essentially are go toward residential pace. They talk about these these disclosures that you have to make to your contract and your contract should make to the property owner. Those are all things that at a point of sale product like residential where the cons individual consumer where, 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 your, where your mom or dad, your aunt or uncle are confronted by a contractor who's like two people in a truck trying to sell them something. They don't have that kind of equality of knowledge, whereas in commercial pace, because you have to you have to go through the gauntlet, and I do mean the gauntlet of lender consent, which is whoever has has lien on that property, whether it's a it's a it's a if it's a bank or anyone else has has to say yes. It's a it's an arm's length commercial transaction um, that essentially two equal part two equal bodies are negotiating with, and so. All those provisions that are struck out in red go go toward creating a, con a contract playing field that doesn't exist in commercial, and it doesn't exist because lender consent doesn't re doesn't require doesn't require it uh, in the same way that if it were in comm in a commercial transaction as it would be in residential, and that that's one of those barriers that both property owners and capital providers look at and kind of scratch their heads and go, why is that there? And it's it's one of those things that contributes to the hassle factor of people deciding to want to go forward and opt into and get, obtaining CPAs financing as well. And, and uh, Madam Chair, I think that um, um, Mr. Kellogg can also can also add some light onto that and on, on some of these other questions as well. I don't mean to hog it all. It's all right. Thank you very much, Mr. Kellogg. Please go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add to Mr. Yaki's comment that 
their, the energy performance of these projects is verified by a third party. So this is, these are truly projects that are creating a, a value benefit and, a, and an improvement in the efficiency or water conservation or seismic strengthening of the project. So these are uh, properties and projects that uh, are not just um, done over here on the side. They are really um, evaluated by a third party and then presented to the county uh, for their approval process. And I did also want to add to the uh, question answer that uh, Michael, uh, Mr. Yaki provided regarding um, where these projects occur, because I think Senator Neal was appropriately wondering about, um, are these only in downtown areas? And uh, I happen to have just been reviewing projects in Colorado, and uh, there are numerous projects in, in rural areas of, of small scale. There are agricultural related projects. There are projects that are occupied by uh, nonprofit organizations. So there is a great diversity of projects and uh, the economic development as well as the um, environmental benefits, I think are an important combination here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Neal, go ahead. Okay, so my last question and then I'm, so, I'm, I'm done. So in section 19 on the amendment, this is where you guys are talking about the liability. And um, I get that this is private, um, but my question there was, um, I guess the liability of the residential person who, um, cause you say, um, I don't know if this applies to them, but this is just where any municipality or governing body um, is not liable at law or in equity. And so I'm wondering, you know, what begged the question was the municipalities are off the hook, but what what is the liability structure if the the entity who gets involved in this project, you know, has unclean hands, which is an equity concept, and then um, can the rights be assigned um, if it comes down to a lawsuit or an issue? Senator Neal, uh, let me address that. The reason for the liability protections is because municipalities find themselves reluctant to get involved with the fact that they are putting their assessment on the property and wondering the, same, the, question, the question you're asking, which is they don't want to get dragged into something. This transfers all the risk between the property owner and the capital and the capital provider where it appropriately belongs. But it, do, but it does not do, I, I guess, the only way I can say this is that this is not residential. This is commercial. And the a average CPACE amount is, I don't think it is any average, but a typical CPACE amount is in somewhere in the neighborhood of, of over a million dollars, which means that the property itself is worth probably over five, five to $10 million uh, in its value. Is This is... We, I don't think we've ever, no, I can say it firmly. We've not encountered a single situation in 10 years, 2,500 projects and $2.4 billion worth of financing in commercial pays where any property owner has alleged fraud or misrepresentation. And, and, and the answer is pretty, pretty easy why. Because this property is actually evaluated and underwritten three times. First time by the original lender on the property. Second time by a company like ourselves. And the third time by that by the by the lending company who oh, the lend, the lending company with the mortgage on the property to see whether or not what we're doing is going to adversely impact their interests, which means essentially, does a property owner have the ability to pay? Is it going to create value to the property? Is it something that we even care about because the, the the lender consent discretion is absolute and unfettered. There is no reasonability standard. They can just simply say, I don't like you. I don't like Pace. I don't like that landowner. Just no. 
But the fact is, is that we most of them are reasonable. They look at this carefully. But if it pencils out, it pencils out because it's good for them, for the property owner, not just not just for not just for us. And certainly, this is a situation where the property owner is often a developer or a larger property owner. They have their own contractors that they use. If we don't come and come and show up with with a contractor to try and you know sell them a bill of goods, and we can't anyway because the bank won't say yes unless it pencils out. So that's that, so. In other words, we we accept the liability, we accept the risk, and we try and create an opportunity for a municipality to offer the program by immunizing them from any fallout from the transaction. Thank you. Any additional questions from the committee? Uh, Vice Chair Orenshaw, please. Thank you, Chair. And my question either for Mr. Yaki or Mr. Kellogg, looking at the conceptual amendment, and I'm looking at uh, the bottom of page four, the, the language in green about a municipality may assign the assessment and lien to the capital provider and the capital provider is solely responsible for the billing collection and the enforcement of an assessment imposed on the real property. Is this uh, consistent with what's happening in other states that that have this kind of financing of projects or would it be something new for Nevada? I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit about that. Sure, um, I'll go and then Mr. Kellogg can, can, can also give the national perspective, but I was involved in, in writing the Tennessee legislation, which does exactly the same thing. The Washington state legislation, which does the exact same thing. There are many states across, I would say, I would say close to a majority of the states right now do that. And it's actually becoming a best practice, again, because what we find is that local governments, especially county governments, aren't too thrilled with, well, some of the officials there aren't too thrilled, um, which is a euphemistic way of saying they don't want to do it. They, 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 they don't want to get involved in the billing, the collection, and the enforcement. They, would, they say, look, this is, this is, we understand the government has to do the assessment. We understand this is part of the financing, but we really don't want to get involved with the, with the rest of the process. We have enough on our plate as it is now. Notwithstanding the fact that probably only two to three projects a year might get funded in any particular local locality at the most, the 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 fact that we have treasurers and tax collectors saying, "Can you not put this on us?" led the industry uh, to work with capital markets and rating agencies to accept this, and we find that it makes it easier for local governments to adopt if they don't have to figure out whether or not they have to change their software to deal with these, these new assessments coming in. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Yaki. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Earnshaw. Um, additional questions from the committee? All right, not seeing any. Um, Senator Brooks, are you ready for us to go ahead and go to support opposition and neutral, or, or do you have some comments? I do have some comments, and and I just want to um, you know note that when when we did this in 2017, we a lot of what was out there was residential, and we tried to tailor this for for uh, commercial, but a lot of the concerns were brought up based upon residential experience and protecting of the residential markets, and so we incorporated a lot of that stuff to to alleviate people's concerns. What happened is is it created an environment where we didn't do any projects. And since then, four years later, there's been quite the evolution in the pace, the commercial pace marketplace, and a lot of lessons learned to get us to a place with some of our, our neighboring states have, have annual legislatures. So they've gotten to take multiple bites at the apple in the last four years. And so um, I, I, I just, before we go to the comments, I just want, it, this is permissive. This tells no one to do anything. It allows municipalities to, to enter into an arrangement on terms, and it allows lenders to enter into an arrangement with a building owner or developer. Um, this does, uh, uh, the lender must agree. There, this does not force any lender to do anything. A lender must agree. And this does not change the, the, the current lien holder position in the current statutes. And, um, and this does not require a county to use its 
authority um, uh, uh, to, to accommodate this. And so these are all kind of myths that are out there sometimes. And I just want to make sure that, that, that those are some points I just really wanted to drive home. And, um, and so with that, um, I, I, uh, unless uh, uh, Mr. Yaki or, or Mr. Kellogg have any closing comment, um, prepare to go uh, and, and listen to the testimony. I appreciate that, Senator Brooks, and I appreciate you um, clarifying that it's permissive. Mr. Yaki or uh, Mr. Kellogg, did you have any closing comments or are you good? No closing comments, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we will go to support uh, broadcasting when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of SB 283, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 505, Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, this is Peter Guzman, president of the Latin Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to first uh, thank uh, uh, all of you for your service and, and, and allowing me to uh, give testimony today. And I'd also like to thank Senator Brooks, um, who came out and really explained this uh, uh, at the Latin Chamber uh, straight talk and, and, and really educated a lot of, uh, of our business leaders um, on this uh, important uh, legislation. Most importantly, this bill will aid in Nevada's recovery and foster much needed job growth throughout the state. It gives options and, and options are good. The financing mechanism this program provides supports numerous small businesses who have been hit the hardest over the last year. Additionally, this program is part of Governor Sisolak's climate initiative. For these reasons and, and, and a few more, uh, but mostly because we, we stand behind uh, financing options and giving access to, to, to capital to get construction sites uh, going and get the little guy working. And so I, I urge you to support uh, SB 283. Thank you, Chair and committee members for your time today. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 851, please slowly spill and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Chair Dondaro Loop. This is Chase Whittemore, uh, W-H-I-T-T-E, Amos and Mary, O-R-E, with our Genton partners here today, um, testifying in support on behalf of Nevada Builders Alliance. And um, we just want to put uh, me too on the record. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 293, 294, I'm sorry. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Madam Chair and members of the committee for the record, Callie Wilsey with the city of Reno. That's C-A-L-L-I-W-I-L-S as in Sam E-Y. We are here in support of SB 283. We'd like to thank the bill sponsor for all of the outreach that occurred prior to today's hearing. There were numerous discussions and we appreciate the sponsor working with us to understanding our to understand our existing CPACE program and how to improve the existing language. As part of our sustainability efforts, the city of Reno launched a program to improve the efficiency of commercial, industrial, and multifamily buildings by 20% by 2025, and we pledged technical support and financial options to support the industry in reaching this goal. In April of 2019, the Reno City Council unanimously approved a resolution to kickstart our CPACE program uh, and catalyze investments in energy efficiency and renewable energy through this voluntary financing program. We appreciate the bill sponsor bringing this legislation forward. We hope these changes will increase utilization of the program. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 475. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Kelly Crompton representing the city of Las Vegas. That's K-E-L-L-Y-C-R-O-M-P-T-O-N. Um, would like to put our support of 
SC283 on the record and thank the bill sponsor and other stakeholders for um, all of the work that they did on the conceptual amendment. Um, and thank you for uh, getting us to a support position. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 401. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, this is Kathy Flanagan with the Southern Nevada Water Authority. That's K-A-T-H-Y-F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N. The Southern Nevada Water Authority and its member agencies are working diligently to maximize the availability of existing water supplies and reduce overall water demands through unprecedented drought conditions. We support SB 283 and its inclusion of water efficiency projects as a type of qualified improvement project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. If you recently just joined us, we are currently in support of SB 283. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers left in support at this time. Thank you very much. We'll go to opposition. To testify in opposition of SB 283, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 626, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Chair and members. For the record, my name is Rob Wilson. R-O-B-W-I-L-S-O-N with the Nevada Credit Union League, and we are opposed to SB 283 with the proposed amendment. First, let me start by thanking the author of the bill for his open door throughout the process, and a thank you to the sponsors for sharing the language with us early and for the continued dialogue. Business owners in Nevada are still feeling the effects of the lingering COVID pandemic, and NTLL wants to ensure that there are sufficient protections for business owners in the state that may opt to utilize the PACE programs. I will list out our concerns with the proposed amendments and look forward to our conversations in the future. Um, number one, a number of safeguards that require the information to be collected, reported, and made available to the other lenders and lien holders evaluating the proposed transaction are removed and replaced with opinions of contractors. Secondly, there's much less transparency being provided to those lenders and lien holders being asked to consent, resulting in much greater potential for projects to be financed that, provi that provide little or no measurable economic benefit. Three, any requirements that force an evaluation of the actual financial benefit to be gained from the proposed transactions as compared to the estimated cost are largely removed. This increases the potential for projects to be financed that provide little or no measurable economic benefit to the property as well as for potential fraud. Four, the structure of the transaction has moved farther away from the pace of special assessment financing arrangement to one more akin with, to a traditional direct commercial loan transaction, but with super priority lien status. Bond requirements are removed. Governing bodies have less involvement approval, including in the event of a default. Five, any ability to challenge a transaction is effectively removed once a lien is recorded, regardless of whether the change is based on fraud or mistake. Additionally, the requirements for judicial foreclosure is removed in favor for a non-judicial foreclosure option. These two changes significantly increase the risk to other lenders and lien holders, as well as to the property owner. Six, while language prohibiting the ability to challenge a transaction was removed, the door is still open to non-judicial foreclosure by virtue of deed of trust language, which remains a concern. Finally, there's no clarity of who will regulate lenders and capital providers, particularly for those outside of the state of Nevada. That is a little lengthy list, but NTL is hopeful that we'll be able to work together with the sponsored insured CPACE program, offers protection for small businesses who are still very much recovering from the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 863, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Senate Government Affairs Committee. This is Dagny Stapleton, D-A-G-N-Y-S-T-A-P-L-E-T-O-N. I'm the Executive Director of NACO, Nevada Association of Counties, representing Nevada's counties. Counties do have some concerns about this bill, including uh, regarding the proposed amended version of the bill. We do appreciate the sponsor and stakeholders being open to working on this. Um, and we would like the committee uh, to take a look at a few issues uh, that are still in the amendment, including the following. Um, first, the lien status of the proposed assessments in the case of a default. 
As written, the, assess, the assessment liens are given superior priority on a property. This would give near the same status as property taxes. So this gives a power to private holders that is usually reserved for county or government only. Um, also, in the event that a property owner were to default, um, this adds another potential debt to the property that in some circumstances um, could prevent properties from being resold at all um, and becoming what we call zombie parcels on our tax rolls. We're also concerned about Section 16, uh, which allows for up to 90% of the value of a property to be taken up by the combination of this assessment and other liens. Committing 90% of the value of your property to debt is a very high ratio for any property owner and potentially the health of their investment. Finally, we are also concerned uh, with the allowed use of county bonds to finance these projects. Again, we appreciate the sponsor and stakeholders being willing to work with us and communicating with us on this bill. Uh, we appreciate the committee allowing us to put these concerns on the record. We are committed to working with the sponsor in hopes that we can find language that, from the fiscal standpoint, would make counties uh, more comfortable with the legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Good evening. For the record, my name is Phyllis Gergevich, P-H-Y-L-L-I-S-G-U-R-G-E-V-I-C-H. And I'm commenting on uh, behalf of the Nevada, Nevada Bankers Association. So thank you, Chair Dundero Loop, for allowing us to comment today. And thank you, committee members, for your time. And I also want to thank the author and the sponsor of the bill, Senator Brooks, for allowing us to engage. We've had ongoing stakeholder conversations and we, we, we really appreciate that. And our hope is that um, if we can address our concerns that we've outlined, that we can get to a neutral position. Um, for a little bit of background, um, Nevada Bankers Association, we were very engaged in 2017 um, with the stakeholders and put a lot of hours into crafting the commercial PACE program in Nevada. Um, and over the years, our members have become very comfortable with well-run pace, commercial PACE programs um, across the country. Um, members have really seen the benefit that can be achieved, and um, we, we want to be a part of expanding and advancing energy and resiliency initiatives here in Nevada. So as the PACE evolves, it makes sense. We understand um, that there's going to be a need for the program to evolve as well, but we do have concerns that Nevada is going to be losing um, some key uh, provisions and protections from, um, that would differentiate, differentiate this from a well-run CPACE program. Um, we've worked with stakeholders. We've, we share the concerns that were outlined by the Nevada Credit Union League and um, our primary concerns really center on lien holders receiving adequate materials, making sure that there's a transparent and formal process for um, really the application and the approval process. On the lien holder consent side, we recognize that the lender can always say no, but that's not the goal. Um, we want to have more qualified projects, and we think that the quickest path to a yes would be through a standard packet of reporting information as exists in the current law. Um, and in terms of clarity, there's things like this new assessment agreement versus the preferred existing term of consent agreement that's not really defined. Um, we've got safeguard concerns about um, losing clarity and transparency in the application and approval process. Um, lack of definition or even the inclusion of a program administrator, uh, coupled with the, it seems that uh, uh, you could designate any, I think the word is any third party to be an administrator. And it looks like it's on a per project basis. Not, not quite sure that's correct or the intent, but it's problematic. Um, Thank you so very much. In, 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 just so, wrap it sorry. up, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just say that um, we, we thank the chair and, and the committee members for the opportunity to share our concerns today. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 739. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. 
Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Joanna Jacob, J-O-A-N-N-A-J-A-C-O-B, Government Affairs Manager for Clark County. Madam Chair, I'll keep this quick, given the late hour. Um, we are in opposition today, hoping to get out of opposition. We have committed to work with Senator Brooks and the bill sponsors um, on some of the concerns. I'll just echo the concerns that were put on the record by Nevada Association of Counties. We also are looking at the new amendment. Um, Amendment that was filed by Senator Brooks, and want to thank him and the bill proponents for all of the changes that they have done so far. Um, we do have some of the same concerns as Nevada uh, Association of Counties, so I will not um, include those. But I think that the issue of um, the 90% loan to value, um, lien to value, excuse me, uh, ratio is of concern to Clark County. Uh, we will continue to work with the bill sponsor and hopefully get to a position, the county would like to be able to offer these. So I know that the language is permissive, but as the previous caller said, I, hopefully the goal would be that we would be able to be in a position to actually offer this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. We are currently in opposition of SB 283. To testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Neutral, please. Testify neutral on SB 283. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 716, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 716, please press star six now to unmute yourself. Thank you. Please begin. Good afternoon, Chair Dondero Loop, Vice Chair Orenshaw, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Ryan Bellows, R-Y-A-N-B-E-L-L-O-W-S, and I'm the Director of Labor and External Relations for NV Energy. NV Energy would like to testify in neutral on Senate Bill 283. We are reviewing the amended language and we look forward to working with the bill sponsor on this bill. NV Energy supports energy efficiency as one of the solutions that will allow this state to meet its decarbonization goals. We currently offer an array of energy efficiency products and services, many of which are referenced in this bill to help all of our customers conserve energy and lower their utility bills. And this includes uh, both commercial customers and municipalities. We want to review how our current programs and services uh, compare with the programs and services referenced in this bill, um, and we look forward to working with the other stakeholders as this bill progresses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 005. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Uh, good evening, Chairwoman Dondero Loop, Vice Chairman Orenshaw, and members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Taylor, J E N N I F E R T A Y L O R, and I am honored to serve as the Deputy Director for Intergovernmental Relations for the Governor's Office of Energy. GOE offers the following neutral testimony for Senate Bill 283. GOE sponsored AB5 in 2017, which was codified in NRS Chapter 271 as PACE enabling legislation, which provided for the creation by a local government of a local improvement district that includes an energy efficiency improvement project or renewable energy project on commercial properties. Since the enactment of AB5, GOE has worked with local governments on PACE by facilitating an informative PACE webinar government, uh, sorry, PACE webinar and through its membership on DOE's PACE Working Group, and that's Department of Energy. Uh, Senator Brooks referenced the state climate strategy, evaluated and analyzed how expanding PACE would impact Nevada's greenhouse gas emissions, climate justice, and state and local governments. The strategy also evaluated the feasibility of PACE expansion in Nevada. While the commercial PACE program can expand adoption of energy efficiency measures necessary to, to reduce GHG emissions, additional opportunities for robust changes may require PACE expansion. 
GOE has been informed that an amendment was proposed to Senate Bill 283, which will further clarify procedures as well as include important resiliency components, such as storage and microgrids, which could also align with GOE's work in energy assuredness. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this neutral testimony for Senate Bill 283. Should the committee have any questions or need additional information, we stand ready to provide um, our office as a resource. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. We are currently neutral on SB 283. To testify neutral, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers neutral at this time. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Brooks, any closing comments, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Dondero and members of the committee. I, I thank you for granting us the time to have such a thorough um, uh, hearing on a complicated subject. And um, I, I just want to um, let the committee know and the chair know that we are still working with, um, we have the uh, Credit Union League Bankers Association, NACO and Clark County, and am open to any suggestions that make for a better bill. Um, but but to, to most of their concerns, the the um, again, I just state this is permissive. If they have a concern about their bonding capacity, they don't they don't do it. If they have concern about being a, a credit union or a bank who's concerned about possibly lending to one of these projects, nobody's ask nobody's making them do that. And so. Um, the, the ultimate protection for those organizations who are in opposition is they don't need to participate. And it, but if they can bring forward some language that helps us get to a better place that would help them want to participate, that's the goal. And so we're still working with them right now to do that. And so I appreciate your time this evening and, and that, is, uh, that is all I have tonight. All right, thank you very much, uh, Senator Brooks, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Yaki and Mr. Kellogg joining us this evening, and thank you for your time and expertise. And now I will uh, hand over the gavel to Vice Chair Orenshaw, and I am going to present a bill, and I thank you all for your patience and time this evening. And uh, I will wrap my head around what I need to do, and we'll get busy. So Vice Chair, go ahead, please, when you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Dondero Loop. And with your permission, I will go to Senate Bill 360, if that pleases the Chair, and open the hearing on Senate Bill 360. And whoever uh, got to present that, please go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Chair Orenshaw. I'm going to uh, open the bill up, and then I'm going to hand it over to Carter Bundy and Randy, Randy Sotero. Thank you, Vice Chair Orenshaw. For the record, I am Marilyn Dondero Loop, representing Senate District 8 in Clark County, and I'm pleased to present Senate Bill 360 to the committee, which revises the appointment of members to the Board of Public Employees Benefits Program to ensure the board best present, represents our public employees. I'm joined for this presentation by Carter Bundy and Randy Sotero. I would like to call the committee's attention to the proposed consensus amendment available on Nellis, which in part deletes any changes to the Public Employees Retirement Board. I will be discussing the bill as set forth in the proposed amendment. Then I will turn the presentation over to Mr. Bundy and Mr. Soltero to provide additional background and details. As you are aware, the Board of Public Employee Benefits Program has the incredibly important responsibility of establishing benefits for Nevada's hardworking public employees. The board is composed of 10 members, including six members with the following qualifications. Two members who are professional employees of ENCHI, two members who are retired for public employment, and two members who are classified state employees. Currently, all these members are appointed by the governor with the requirement that the appointments be made upon consideration of any recommendations from organizations that represent each of these groups. Senate Bill 360, as amended, will provide that the board better represents each of these public employee groups by requiring the governor to make these appointments by lists, from lists of nominations submitted by professional organizations that represent the largest number of each of these public employee groups. 
Specifically, section two of the bill as amended require, provides that the governor must make the appointments of two and she professional employee members, two members retired from public employment, the two members who are classified employee for a list of nominations submitted by the labor organization representing the largest number of classified state employees in the program. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Mr. Bundy and Mr. Soltero, and they will uh, add some additional information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Dondera Loop. Thank you for presenting Senate Bill 360. Mr. Bundy, or Mr. Soltero, whoever would like to begin, please go ahead. Um, Vice Chair Orenshaw, members of the committee, for the record, Carter Bundy with AFSCME. We want to thank um, Chairwoman Dondero Loop. I think she explained the bill uh, better than I ever could. I will say that we did meet with stakeholders, uh, and that is the reason for the amendments. Um, there was pretty universal consensus that at this time we shouldn't do anything with the PERS board. Um, and we also listened to uh, other people who uh, are involved with PEB, and we believe that this bill will give uh, rank and file workers uh, and retirees a voice in their health care. So um, I'll be available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bundy. And Mr. Soltero, thanks for joining us this evening. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, the members of the committee, uh, Randy Soltero, representing uh, AFSCME uh, on this bill. Um, not a whole lot to add to that other than um, we, uh, I think what is so important is that this bill started out as a, uh, a uh, to add to, uh, to, well, to clarify the positions that um, the uh, classified state employees uh, would are chosen. And through the state participation with the stakeholders group, which is a lot of folks, and I think you're gonna hear from them tonight, um, that uh, this kind of uh, uh, turned into something that we think is a lot better. So I uh, won't uh, go on any further, but I'm ready to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Saltero. Members, any questions uh, regarding the, the proposed conceptual amendment to Senate Bill 360 on Nellis? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. All right. I will now go to support uh, broadcasting. Whoever would like to speak in support, who's on the phone line, we're lotting two minutes per caller. Thank you so much. To testify in support of SB 360, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 338, Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, um, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this is Priscilla Maloney from the Ask Me Retirees, representing them tonight. That's P-R-I-S-C-I-L-L-A-M-A-L-O-N-E-Y. I want to thank Ask Me and Senator Don Darrow Loop for bringing forward this bill. This is something that's actually needed attention for quite some time, and the AFSCME retirees are in full support of the bill as amended and appreciate um, AFSCME's willingness to work with all the stakeholders on um, this bill, and it re is reflected in that amendment. So thank you very much, and we fully support this bill tonight. Thank you. Please spell these balance six your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, good evening. This is Kent Irvin, K-E-N-T-E-R-V-I-N with the Nevada Faculty Alliance. Thank you, Senator Dondera Loop and committee members for being, and thank you for bringing this bill. We support SB 360 with the amendment. Whenever there's been a vacancy of the NC positions on the board, and the Nevada Faculty Alliance has worked very hard to identify strong candidates and and provide uh, several nominees to the governor with a variety of strengths and different areas of expertise so that the governor can, has, uh, can make good choices. We don't think this bill will change our process very much. Uh, we do support the bill. Uh, I, I've been following 
have, since the mid-2000s, closely as an advocate for faculty, first for UNR and then for the statewide organization. And about five or six years ago, we, we started seeing a phenomenon where a majority of the appointed board members were less engaged and more likely to rubber stamp staff proposals. And I believe that led in part to the issues that were identified in the legislative audit of PEB. Uh, that came out last year. And this bill, I believe, will help correct that by bringing on board members who are um, sure to be advocates of the uh, of their various constituencies, and in particular for the classified staff. Thank you. If you recently just joined us, we are currently in support of SB 360. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, you have no more callers in support at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. Now, if we go, can go to opposition, anybody who'd like to speak in opposition to the measure, we're allotting two minutes per caller. To testify in opposition of SB 360, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Anybody who'd like to speak neutral to the measure? We're allotting two minutes per caller. To testify neutral on SB 360, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 139, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. For the record, Laura Rich, Executive Officer of the Public Employees Benefits Program. I am testifying today in neutral. I want to start out by saying that the, uh, the PED Board has not had an opportunity to weigh in on this bill. However, there is a poor, uh, PED Board meeting this upcoming Thursday, so I do anticipate the Board taking a position on this legislation. PEB has identified some potential unintended issues with the bill as drafted first as a union exclusive representative or certified or change, the board member membership would change as well. The PEB board, uh, the PEB program is very complex and it often takes board members a significant amount of time to acquire that expertise. So constant changes in the board representation would not provide the stability and subject matter expertise that plan participants deserve. Additionally, there's a concern of the possibility of disproportionate weighted representation on the board. For example, two of the 10 board positions are already allocated to represent the system of higher education. So should the largest uh, labor organization also become uh, an NG labor group, 60% of the board could represent the system of higher education. Uh, a labor group that is not NG could still achieve 40% representation on the board. Thank you again, Chair, for the opportunity to speak today. Vice Chair, you have no more callers neutral at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. And Chair Dondero, Lou, Mr. Bundy, Mr. Saltero, any closing comments you'd like to make? Um, Vice Chair Orrin Shaw, uh, members of the committee, for the record, Carter Bundy with AFSCME. Um, just to clarify, none of these spots would be limited to union members um, at all. Uh, they're limited to two NG people as they currently are. We haven't changed who gets the spots. And to uh, the last point that was brought up, um, NG wouldn't get additional spots. Uh, no one would. NG still has its two spots. It just changes the list from which the governor chooses uh, the spot. So none of those would change. Um, and I know the amendments have just come out, but I wanted to clarify that. That's all. Very much. Thank you, Mr. Bundy. Thank you, Mr. Saltero. Thank you, Chair Dondero Loop, for presenting this legislation. I'll now close the hearing on Senate Bill 360. And the last item on our agenda is public comment. Broadcasting, if there's anyone who wishes to speak during the public comment portion, we're allotting two minutes per speaker. Thank you, Vice Chair. To speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. 
Again, for those of you that just joined us, to speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 528, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, uh, Ma M Madam Vice, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Barry Gold, G-O-L-D. I am the Director of Government Relations for AARP Nevada, and I would just like to thank the committee for voting unanimously to pass SB 200, which will enable Nevada employees to save for retirement through payroll deduction. So when they retire, they will have a secure retirement, and they'll retire with means, M-E-A-N-S, instead of needs, N-E-E-D-S. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Currently, we are taking public comment. To speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. I share you have no more callers left at this time. All right. Well, thank you very much, broadcasting. Thank you to all the presenters, and uh, we are adjourned.